2021 regular board meeting to order at 3.31 p.m. This meeting is being recorded. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands and traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people. Ms. Wilson-Jones, the roll call, please. Director DeWalt. Director, uh, Director DeWalt. DeWalt will not be joining us tonight. Okay. Uh, Director Dury. Here. And Director Harris is not able to join. Um, Vice President Hersey. Here. Director Here. Rankin. Uh, Director Rivera Smith. Present. And President Hampson. Here. Superintendent Jones is also joining us for today's meeting, and additional staff will be briefing the board as we move through the agenda. This meeting is being held remotely, consistent with the governor's proclamation on open public meetings. The public is being provided remote access today by phone and through SPS TV by broadcast and streaming on YouTube. To facilitate this meeting, I will ask all participants to ensure you are muted when you are not speaking. Staff may be muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear directors and staff. I will now turn it over to you, Superintendent Jones, for your comments. Thank you, President Hampson and board members. Uh, I want to start out by just saying thank you to our families and students for your patience and your perseverance over this last school year. Uh, I believe we closed out 2021 very strong. Our, our educators and staff and school leaders were amazing. Uh, for example, we, we stood up 40 meal sites, lifted up tech resource centers, vaccination sites, support hotlines, and really supported the essential needs of our families and students. Uh, this last week, um, based on my school visits, there were a lot of good spirits of student and staff, lots of optimism, but people were certainly ready for summer break. Um, so that, that's, and it's well deserved. Uh, I also had the opportunity to attend graduations. Over 3,700 of our SPS scholars received their diplomas this, this week ago. Uh, and our staff did a tremendous job of making the events meaningful for students and their families. Uh, no one was turned away. We figured out a way to bring everybody in that wanted to participate. And I wanna also thank the board members for, for your participation. So now we are 69 days away from the start of the 21-22 school year. Uh, we have really good experience from the 21, this last school year uh, to learn from. And I'm, yeah. confident, I'm confident that we're proactively moving forward for a strong fall reopening. Uh, so I just wanna say I'm grateful for all the hard work and the expertise, all the professionalism of our SPS team. And I'm looking forward to getting to down to business for this summer, again, for a strong in-person full-time reopening September 1st. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jones. We have now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? Absolutely, just confirming, can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Let's... You're not super loud, but we can hear you. Okay, let me see if I can turn it up. Is that better? Yes. Okay. All right, I move for approval of the consent agenda. Second. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Those aye. opposed? Aye. The consent agenda has passed unanimously. So we've now reached the public testimony portion of the agenda, but it is not yet 345. I would ask if any committee chairs uh, have any board committee reports that they would like to give now. 
in lieu of taking a recess to keep the meeting going and then we'll uh, re uh, begin testimony at 3.45 p.m. Uh, let me um, check in first with you, Director Rankin. I was just pulling up my calendar trying to um, place myself back in space and time and remember um, have we had a meeting since uh, I don't know. I don't think I have anything new to report between last board meeting and this one in part as far as committee work goes. Um, what about for let's see operations? I think we actually um, inadvertently skipped committee reports during the last board meeting. So anything to report from either of the last two is um, up for. Oh, did we? OK, um, we had uh, well, yeah, we had um, Superintendent Jones join us, which was great for our last our committee meeting um, for this month. And it was a long one. <laughs> it was a good juicy one to join in. Um, lots of uh, really good discussion. Um, and uh, Director Harris requested, there was so much to talk about. Director Harris requested um, that we consider a July committee meeting. And so I'm talking to staff now about um, maybe instead of a meeting, because I know staff time is so, um, oh, so, um, just taken up by lots of things that um, maybe we could have a, a sort of July report, extra July report instead of having that meeting. So um, look for more on that and that would come to the full board. Um, we discussed um, an update about isolation and restraint. Uh, we discussed the um, some items that are going to come before us today. Um, I don't think there's anything else new or different, um, just uh, good work. And I'm uh, well, actually I'll say um, it's a really there's a really great feeling of from um, teaching and learning staff across all departments of um, moving in the same direction. And I think that's partly in due to some, uh, you know, board st student centered outcomes and uh, some shifts in in um, leadership and departments and uh, I feel really uh, hopeful about staff and board moving together in service of students and so I think that was partly why that meeting was so long because there was just a lot of good good things aligning um, in support of students and, and thinking about um, uh, coming back just really really strong in the fall. Um, so yeah we'll hear about some of that stuff in introduction. OK, and I can go next with um, executive committee and then I'll um, call on you after that, Director Hersey, for the uh, for ANF. Um, an exec our last executive committee uh, meeting, we did a brief update on um, well, we we will be reviewing um, our Teamsters. Um, uh, local number 174 collective bargaining um, agreement um, today during info. I mean, intro, and then um, we uh, did a an sort of administrative timeline update on our progress with respect to um, our board goals and student outcomes focused governance. And um, and then we spoke briefly about the use of Let's Talk, uh, which is a customer service platform um, from uh, Chief of Communications, uh, Carrie Campbell um, about the prospect of the board moving away from the board, the, simply the board off um, school board email as our sole source of, of communication with constituents, constituents and moving to something a bit more robust, which would um, actually allow us to track what constituents are, are emailing us about. And, um, and then allow for us to know whether or not um, there's actually been a response to a constituent, which we don't because of um, OPMA issues when we all get emailed um, and can't reply all because of, of op uh, Open Public Meetings Act restrictions. We um, have pretty poor customer service when it comes to emails that come to the board. So that was a good, good robust conversation. 
Um, and I think we'll be um, uh, moving forward with, with some of those um, changes to um, provide better uh, responsiveness and customer service. And then um, also a um, quick update on our um, new website that's referred to as our content management system. Um, and then um, the uh, uh, there was a, a brief update from um, our um, from our Department of um, Engagement and Equity um, around Policy 0030, which is an annual report. Which uh, once that's um, fully posted in its full form, I think that annual report is actually available. Um, on um, on the website as well, and um, that was a um, a good conversation, a very thorough um, report um, representing departments from throughout the district, and um, and then a note um, about based on the nature of the new contract with our with Dr. Jones that the superintendent evaluation process um, timeframe would be different because we have a different contractual um, obligation for evaluation with him than if we had followed our prior superintendent evaluation um, uh, calendar as um, um, traditionally dictated by, by policy. Um, and then a brief um, discussion of the superintendent search process and uh, the, the need to get the contents of a um, request for proposal put together so that we can get the support that the board needs um, in order to get that um, search process going um, here locally. Um, and that's kind of it for um, for executive committee. Our next meeting isn't until August 15th. And I imagine uh, that in terms of the um, work that we're doing on um, policies, um, annual reports, uh, the executive committee work plan, as well as the broader board calendar and work plan, um, which will be teeing up for that that August timeframe. Um, we will probably have a lot. I hope if we're <laughs> doing our job over the summer, we will have um, a lot to to look at. Um, at that time, we will have completed our work um, with the Harvard Institute and be further along on the board goals and student outcomes um, focused governance commitment. So I'm looking forward to um, doing the work necessary to make that a, a particularly productive. Um, meeting. And I will then turn it over to Director Hersey. It's only 3.43, so we have time for one more update yeah. on ANF committee. Absolutely. I'll try to make this quick. We had a number of items come through ANF last month, um, many of which you will see on our agenda in various capacities tonight. Uh, some of those things including approval of a new website content management system, along with experimental edu uh, updates on our experimental education unit, Head Start, Washington Schools Risk Management Pool, uh, our resolution 29, or excuse me, 2019-2037 for fixing and adopting the 2021 budget, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second as well, and then private school um, proportional services. Uh, we also received a number of special attention item updates. Uh, including notifications from our internal audit manager, as well as uh, updates on non-discrimination and affirmative action annual report and whatnot. So uh, really looking forward to, oops, hold on. I think I am looking at the wrong agenda, but it is okay. We will go ahead and move on to the budgetary uh, updates. We had a very productive budget work session that came through uh, on June 9th of last week where we were updated on where our numbers for not only enrollment but other capacities of our budget are. We are planning to, as many folks know, finalize our budget in July of this year, if I'm not mistaken. And so we look forward to taking those necessary and critical steps to make sure that we are supporting Dr. Jones and the rest of the administration in what is going to be a very successful start to the school year. So thank you very much. Okay, and does anybody from operations, um, since Director DeWolf can't join us tonight, um, wanna give any update on that? Or if not, we can just save it for the, maybe just note when the next operations meeting is, if you happen to know.
Anybody from operations? I can look it up. Yeah, hi, I'm sorry. Um, I was looking through my calendar. I don't, we don't have another operations meeting um, until probably August, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah. we, oh. we talked about, we, we, we spoke about some bars we'll see tonight. Um, we, we had the, um, sorry, I'm looking at the agenda right now. Some of, all, um, some of the bars that played the introduction today came through um, operations. A lot of the Bex, PCA, and Jesse, kind of the last couple of them. So um, a lot of that we spoke about um, gearing up for the um, Clean Energy Task Force, which will start recruiting this summer, hopefully for them, I think, by August, and get moving on that. Um, I don't have my notes in front of me, but um, it was a robust meeting, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back together in August. Thank you. Okay, and it looks like uh, the next meeting is August 15th for operations. And yes, we will definitely hear, as we frequently do, uh, a large number of uh, the board action reports coming through are, in fact, from operations. So much of which of what you covered will um, be coming will be up for discussion today. Um, and I'll look to um, uh, directors Rankin and Rivera Smith to. Um, uh, maybe you can alternate in terms of um, taking the role for Director DeWolf and speaking first on the respective bars as they come up. Okay, um, and and also just a note um, before we get a public testimony that um, Director Harris um, had an unfortunate uh, accident and um, she's fine, uh, but uh, her ankle is is messed up and um, she's in quite a bit of pain and and. Um, uh, and not in a position to join us right now. So um, we know you're listening and uh, we uh, wish you some um, recovery and some some rest and um, we'll catch up with you afterwards. Um, okay, so with that, we um, have now reached the public testimony portion of our meeting. We will be taking public testimony by teleconference today as stated on the agenda. For any speakers watching through SPS TV, please call in now to ensure you are on the phone line when your name is called. Board Procedure 1430BP provides the rules for testimony and I ask that speakers are respectful of these rules. I will summarize some important parts of this procedure. First testimony will be taken today from those individuals called from our public testimony list and if applicable, the waiting list, which are included on today's agenda posting on the school board website. Only those who are called by name should unmute their phones and only one person should speak at a time. Speakers from the list may cede their time to another person when the listed speaker's name is called. The total amount of time allowed will not exceed two minutes for the combined number of speakers and time will not be restarted after the new speaker begins. In order to maximize the opportunities for others to address the board, each speaker is allowed only one speaking slot per meeting. A speaker cedes time to a later speaker on the testimony list or waiting list the person to whom time was seated will not be called to provide testimony again later in the meeting as there was only one speaking slot per person. Those who do not wish to have time seated to them may decline and retain their place on the testimony or wait list. Finally, the majority of the speaker's time should be spent on the topic they have indicated they wish to speak about. Ms. Wilson-Jones will read off the testimony speakers. Thank you, President Hansen. Speakers, please remain muted until your name is called to provide testimony. When I call your name, please be sure you have unmuted on your phone and also press star six to unmute on the conference call line. Each speaker will have a two minute speaking time and a chime will sound when your time is exhausted. First on today's testimony list is Amaya Haregi. Amaya Haregi. Maya, if you are on the line, um, you need to press star six to unmute now. I'll move to the next speaker and then I'll call any names we missed again at the end. Um, next on today's test, oh, is that um, Amaya unmuting? Okay, doesn't look yeah, like it. Yeah, this is Amaya. Okay, excellent. Amaya, go for it. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Amaya Howdyhi, and I am Mexican American. I just finished fifth grade at Concord International Elementary. Throughout my six years there, I was in the Spanish English dual language program. I'm going to be speaking about why the dual language program at Concord is so important and why you must support it. 
When I started kindergarten at Concord, it was incredible that there were so many kids, teachers, and staff that looked like me, talked in both Spanish and English like me, and had families from Spanish-speaking countries like me. At the Concord Dual Language Program, we got to learn about ourselves, our family, our culture, and our language. When you see your culture and your language being celebrated and taught, it's like a nice warm hug after being outside in the cold rain of racism. It's a warm hug after everything bad that you have seen and experienced. It was a warm, warm hug that felt really comforting knowing that the teachers always had your back. As you know, racism against Spanish-speaking communities have been growing even more in the U.S. People are told their language isn't important and that being Latinx is bad. People end up not speaking the Spanish that connects them to their family and community. Without the dual language program, I wouldn't have learned to speak, read, and write in Spanish so I can talk with my Spanish-speaking family. In the dual language program, we got to learn about ourselves. My Spanish teachers have always supported everyone and taught us about us. Dual language also helped form my identity and who I am at the Maya Memorial Hawaii. When I was in second grade, I testified before the school board to support the dual language program, and now three years later, I'm here again to ask you to support the program. Although I am moving on to Denny dual language program, my younger sisters and so many other kids in my community still need it. They deserve to also experience having their bilingualism, biliteracy, and biculturalism honored and celebrated. Please, please protect it. Protect it. Thank you. Thank you, Amaya. Next on today's testimony list is Chris Jackins. Chris Jackins. My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124. On the June 7th board minutes, in-person attendance was allowed on June 7th, but not today. The board is going backward. On the budget, the hearing is to occur immediately before the board vote. That reduces board due diligence. On the Northgate contract, two points. Number one, the state considers Northgate School to be historically significant and eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. Number two, yet the district is still proceeding with plans to demolish the school. Please vote no. On the Bulins and Kimball contracts, these actions are being introduced without the contract amount. Is this how the deputy superintendent has been used to conducting business? On the West Seattle Elementary contract, please supply the public with the parcel exchange appraisal, as promised, before voting on the contract. On final acceptance of playground improvements at 10 schools, the report references a project underspend, but lists no amount. Were any projects incomplete? Did any schools lose playground space? On final acceptance of field lighting at Franklin, most of these school levy funds were spent to support city parks department use, not school use. On final acceptance at Magnolia, two points, number one, the report states that the project was, quote, completed over budget, unquote. Number two, the action calls for board approval of a $725,000 budget transfer after the funds have apparently already been expended. Please vote no. Thank you. Next on today's testimony list, Janice White. Janice White. Good afternoon. I'm Janice White, president of the Seattle Special Education PTSA. I wanted to talk this afternoon a little bit about board policy 6902, information technology planning, which is being introduced today. The board action report says that the school board recognizes technology as a critical resource to support learning for each and every student. And the proposed policy states that the IT program shall prioritize technology investments closest to students, educators, and families with clear actions for inclusivity, usability, and accessibility. My concern is that the proposed policy does not mention students with disabilities. Students with disabilities and students who receive special education services are general education students first. If you're going to prioritize technology investments in order to meet goals like inclusivity and accessibility, I think you should make explicit in the policy the requirement to consider the needs of students with disabilities. 
This is especially true because, as you may know, the assistive technology department is housed within the special education department. It's not part of the technology department. And so it's just not clear, based on this proposed policy, how the technology needs of students with disabilities will be addressed in the context of technology planning for the district. So before you adopt this policy, I would just ask and urge you to take a closer look at how to make clear that the needs of students with disabilities will be considered in technology planning going forward. Thank you very much. That was the final speaker on today's testimony list. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Okay, we've now moved to, we now move to the action items on today's agenda. The first item is action item number one, approval of a successor collective bargaining agreement between Seattle School District number one and International Brotherhood of Teamsters Local Union numbers 174 for September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2021. This came through executive committee on June 9th for, uh, and was recommended for approval. May I have a motion for this item? Yeah, absolutely. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute the collective bargaining agreement with the International Union of Teamsters Local 174 with the wage schedules and other attachments in the form of the draft agreement for the period September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2021 attached to the school board action report with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and take any necessary actions to implement the contracts. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second. This item has been moved by, by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera Smith. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Chief Human Resources Officer Noel Treat, I believe you will be briefing us on this item. Uh, yes, good afternoon, directors. Uh, Noel Treat, your Chief HR Officer. I'm pleased to present a tentative one year agreement today between the district and our labor partner, Teamster 174. Uh, these Teamster members provide vital truck driving operations for the district. Uh, the agreement includes some cleanup of collective bargaining agreement language, but the primary issue in the negotiations was wages. Following mediation, the parties uh, reached a tentative agreement at a 2% salary increase for the year, along with a 1% one-time bonus. Teamster members have unanimously ratified this tentative agreement, and it's now before you tonight for, or today for approval uh, with a staff recommendation that you do approve this agreement to move forward. Okay, um, so I am going to go to directors for any comments or questions. And I will just um, briefly state as chair of the executive committee that uh, we're extremely grateful to our Teamsters and the important role that they serve um, in making sure that critical transportation services um, and deliveries are, are made throughout this, this district and um, are grateful to the staff for coming to um, an agreement or a, um, um, a set of, of um, agreements that were able to be accepted unanimously and look forward to future um, good relationship and communications with the, with the Teamsters. Um, I will now go to Director Hersey for comments, questions, uh, or concerns. None for me at this point. Thank you to everyone who's worked on this. I know that it's been a long process and I'm high excited to see an uh, agreement. Director Dury? Uh, no questions for me tonight, thanks on this. Director Versmith? Thank you. Um, yeah, no, no questions. Or, well, no, no questions. I, I do appreciate the work that went into this. I know that um, it was um, there was a little bit of a struggle through it, but I appreciate um, Chief Treats coming into this and and getting us this agreement. Um, look forward to yeah, continuing our relations with the Teamsters. No, no further comments. Thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering about the one year term, if that is typical, if there is benefit 
for the district and for um, Local 174 in in having it be one year instead of two or three years. And what um, I'm just thinking about in terms of bar, you know time it takes to bargain again. Um, if somebody could just tell me a little bit about that, why one year? Yeah, you know, certainly um, oftentimes we do prefer a longer terms agreements just because it provides a level of certainty and, and it alleviates the need to immediately start new bargaining. Um, in this case, uh, the Teamsters wanted to just focus on a one year agreement and have another round of negotiations as we do more market research on salaries before we move towards a longer term agreement. So given that this agreement really just covers this this year through August 31st, um, we'll be starting soon on negotiating a longer term agreement and, and hope to, we have a great relationship with the Teamsters and I think we can hope to reach agreement on a longer term um, in this next round. Sounds great. That's that's kind of what I thought, but I just um, wanted to double check. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Wilson-Jones, will you please call for the vote? Vice President Hersey. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Dury. Aye. President Hampson. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. We will now move to action item number two, amendment number three to the 2020 to 21 City of Seattle uh, FFVP agreement. May I have a motion for this item? Yep. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to accept the August 1st through 31st, 2021 City of Seattle grant to expand the fresh fruit and vegetable program grant funding amendment to include an additional $1,031,600 for a total of up to $2,320,527.06. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second. The item has been moved by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. This item did not go through committee and is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta, I believe you will be briefing us on this item. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you, President Hampson. Um, the district has an agreement with the city of Seattle to distribute fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and uh, given the changes uh, during the past school year with how meals and other foods were um, distributed. There's been uh, enormous demand for these products and in um, this model, um, uh, on top of the fact that we had a USDA waiver, we have been able to distribute, you know, far more than the usual model, which is um, localized to specific schools and has um, an aspect of means testing. Um, these uh, fresh fruits and vegetables were distributed through all our channels that we use to distribute meals um, at distribution sites and also uh, home delivery of meals. And so um, that's why we're adding yet a third amendment. The city is adding additional funding. So we, um, since we've expended all the resources um, or will have expended all the resources, this allows us to carry the program through um, the end of summer. Thank you, uh, Chief Podesta. And let me ask uh, Director Rankin, um, let me go to you first for comments, questions, and concerns. Um, nope, nothing from me. All good, fully support this. Okay, Director Hersey. None for me either. Director Rivera-Smith, I'm sorry, Director Dury. Uh, hi, thanks. I just have a clarifying question. This million dollars is for the month of August, correct? It is. We won't likely expend the full amount of the uh, of the amendment um, and we'll re get reimbursed by the city for what we are able to distribute. Sorry. 
to the we'll get reimbursed by the city for what we do distribute. So yeah, we're for, for our actual cost. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Director Rivera Smith. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Wilson Jones, uh, please call for the vote. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Dury. Aye. Vice President Hersey. Aye. Hampson. Aye. This motion is passed unanimously. We will now move to action item number three, 2021 to 22 City of Seattle Summer Food Service Program Project Services Agreement. May I have a motion for this item? I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to enter a project services agreement with the City of Seattle to receive payment of up to $334,700 to the provide breakfast, lunch, and afternoon snacks for the City of Seattle Summer Food Service Program with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. May I have a second? Second, sorry. This item has been moved by Director Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera Smith. This item did not go through committee and is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Chief Podesta, I believe you will be briefing us again. Yes, uh, thanks again, uh, President Hampson. Annually, the city of Seattle operates a um, summer food service program which distributes uh, meals to young people at a variety of community sites, parks, community centers, and other locations. Um, the uh, Seattle Public Schools has Nutrition Services Department has been the provider of um, food for this program um, for the city for decades. Um, and this is an annual uh, contract um, that will allow us to uh, provide food for that program um, this summer as we normally do. And then again, um, the changes this year, we will all, this is over and above um, the meals we'll be serving um, in our own locations. Um, so, uh, Nutrition services will remain busy as they uh, have for many months. Um, and thank you. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. I'll go first uh, to operations committee member, Director Rivera Smith. Hi, thank you. Thanks, uh, Chief Presta, for this far. Um, I, I was wondering, is it typically that this, because like you said, this has been since the 70s, it says that we've done we've had this partnership. Does it generally come through this late? We're already into the summer and we're seeing this bar now. Is that, did something happen? Is it, I mean, is it COVID, I guess? We're like a lot of like many things. Uh, I can only speak to the last couple of years. It usually comes about now. Our previous contract goes through um, uh, June 30th. So this is a renewal that starts July 1st. So we are providing services already. Um, but yes, uh, it seems despite our best efforts, it's always a last minute um, uh, this discussion with the city. All right, well, I'll just and, and it, it hasn't kept us from providing the service. Great, well, that's my next question about when you get timeliness and if that um, hinders us from getting everything um, you know, set and ready to go. My other question then is, are we continuing uh, to provide the meals um, to any and all of us? I guess uh, under 18 at least, is that going to um, continue this summer? Yes, um, to, we're, we're providing um, meals to anyone 18 and younger. And are the sites updated now on the website or are they gonna change at any point this summer? They are changing. I believe there are 24 sites and they have been posted on the website. So is it gonna change again during the summer or is that set for the summer? No, I think uh, other than the fact that we will um, monitor if, if sites are popular or not and make adjustments if needed, just as we've done in the past, but the, those that's our intent is to keep these sites unless some are highly underutilized or we have other reasons to um, think that other sites might be more successful or to shift staff, but um, we will make certain that people are aware 
and uh, again would be highly unlikely we would um, remove a site that was that was busy. It was only if it wasn't really being used. Thank you. No further questions or comments. OK, Director Hersey. No questions for me. Thank you. Director Dury. No questions. Thank you. Director Rankin. Um, I I don't I doubt we have that many people listening to the meeting today on a beautiful sunny Sunday afternoon or uh, summer afternoon. But I uh, just wanted to reiterate that children 18 and, and younger, you don't have to show I you know school ID. You can pick up food at the school you attend at a different school at a parks department site. Um, this food is for for all children to um, to access and, and take advantage of at schools at um, this contract in particular is for city of Seattle sites. And I know that um, parks department folks are always, you know, happy and excited to to pass out those um, lunches. So please take advantage. And um, yeah, thanks for bringing this forward again and continuing the service. OK, um, and I have no uh, questions. Uh, Ms. Wilson-Jones, the uh, call for the vote, please. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Dury. Aye. Vice President Hersey. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. President Hampson. Aye. Motion is passed unanim unanimously. Okay. We will now move to our introduction items, starting with introduction item number one approval of the 2021 to 22 students, student rights and responsibilities. This came through student supports curriculum and instruction uh, on June 8th and is recommended for approval. Uh, Associate Superintendent Dr. Consi Pedrosa, I believe you will be briefing us. Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, so this motion uh, would approve the 2021-2022 Students' Rights and Responsibilities, uh, which include which contains rules and regulations for student behavior. Uh, this document is annually brought before the board uh, for approval per policy uh, 3200, uh, written rules of student conduct. This year's a proposed document contains changes that reflect Seattle Public Schools commitment to racial equity, authentic student family caregiver engagement, and then safe and welcoming environments for all students. I just want to highlight a few things in regards to this uh, this uh, student, uh, students' rights and responsibilities. Um, this has evolved uh, significantly over the past uh, several years since 2016 uh, to continually to involve more students and families, specifically the ones who are disproportionately impacted by discipline policies procedures. We continue to engage uh, community stakeholders in this process. Um, I just want to uh, thank uh, 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 on this uh, message right here. I want to thank two uh, community members specifically for their work with staff on an individual basis. They were meeting monthly with department staff. So I want to publicly thank Imaja Smith and Molly Mitchell uh, there and for their contributions to this work of, with, in regards to engagement for this document. Um, there's a complete list of community contributors in Appendix A. Um, also, I just want to thank additional staff members, uh, Nikki York and Christy Matfield, uh, who worked alongside uh, Aaron Romanek and Executive Director Pat Sanders, uh, who designed work plans, community engagement schedules, and processes to involve stakeholders throughout this process. I just want to provide a few highlights and then I'll, if you have additional questions, we do have uh, staff here as well as uh, Executive Director Pat Sanders to answer specific questions. But a couple highlights to talk about the students' rights and responsibilities. Uh, we added a page regard, uh, thanking the community members and contributors. We added whack language around early involvement with families and considering other uh, forms of responses to behaviors. Um, uh, in, this, in the staff uh, commitments and school responsibilities section. Uh, the WAC language appears later in the document, but we wanted to, to highlight in this conversation. We added appeals rights and alignment to the dress code policy 3224 in students' rights sections. 
And then we've also updated other behavioral violations within this document. And then we updated language in the high school and middle school sections regarding services and supports available to staff, students, and families when a disciplinary response is necessary. And that was in partnership with interagency academy leadership. Um, and the decision was made to stop um, offering behavior modifications as a requirement that students had to fulfill before returning to the referring schools. Um, we also added additional mitigating and extenuating circumstance fact, uh, extenuating factors, changing aggravating to extenuating factors. And then we also moved several pictures and changes due to community feedback um, and that were um, over representation of students of color in the discipline documents. Um, I just want to just again, this was a very long effort of involving community engagement. We have identified next steps for implementation uh, for this document. And um, I'll, as I mentioned before, I have Executive Director Pat Sanders and staff here to answer any questions from school board members. Thank you, Dr. Pedrosa. And I'm going to go first to Director Rankin for, uh, I'm sorry, Director Rankin, Chair of, of SSCNI Student Supports Curriculum and Instruction Committee to um, start us off with comments, questions, and concerns. Thank you. Um, yeah, this, uh, I think, well, it's come through um, committee as a special attention item a few times this year in response to a request from um, this board at this time last year that uh, uh, it be a more iterative process. Um, last year's approval for the current year student rights and responsibilities um, there was discussion about wanting to really get some alignment with uh, values of this board and some some resolutions that we had passed, wanting to see that more in student rights rights and responsibilities document, and um, because it was sort of a tight a tight timeline, um, uh, we requested to have you know more more engagement um, during the process uh, this year for. The coming year's document and so just um, really appreciate the response from staff on that and the opportunity for um, for us to see different pieces develop over the year and so yeah i just want to say huge thank you to responding to that request and um, working in partnership with us and and giving us us and the community the opportunity to see how it involved and evolved and um I just add my thanks to molly and amija uh, for their work on this document as well. Um, one thing that we've continued to talk about in committee is how um, the importance of this document as a, an informational tool for families to understand really, I mean, partly what, you know, what students are, are uh, what expectations are for student behavior, but also so that they, students and families understand that if there is an incident, um, with some kind of response that involves their student that families understand what what should happen um, and and what what uh, what their rights are <laughs> um, in addition to what their responsibilities are so so we've continued to talk a little bit more about how to make this um, a little bit more accessible and tangible I think right now what we do what the district does is it's it's printed at all printed and distributed at all school sites in first day packets. And um, my guess would be that a lot of families miss it completely or or look at it that that day when they get the back to school packet and then and then sort of forget about it. So we're talking about especially with the you know new website and things, how to sort of help um, help people understand and remember that this exists so that if there's a question and they and they are seeking more support through a process of a response to disciplinary um, action that they understand, uh, you know, how things should go and who, who to turn to for support. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't have any more questions. Just wanted to kind of highlight that ongoing work. This does come annually. And, um, and again, just huge, huge thanks to staff and community for um, taking that collaborative approach and working with us throughout the year um, in support of students. Uh, it's awesome. Happy that it's coming forward today. 
Uh, thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, to you, uh, Director Hersey, um, and then after um, this round, just as, as a note to directors, uh, after this intro item, I'll start to just ask for um, volunteers. So, but for um, for uh, students' rights and responsibilities, I'll continue to call on you by name. So, Director Hersey. I don't have any questions at this point. Thank you. Director Dury. Hi, yeah, so to Director Rankin's point just now about the communication, uh, that was one of my questions is how are we ensuring that students in particular know about this um, and and that it like in reading, it's an incredibly long document and reading it definitely is not at like a, you know, uh, even eighth grade level probably, it's, it's well beyond in college years, most likely, um, and, and I, so I'm curious as to how we are going to distribute this in a way that that students, younger students, all students can access it. And um, also a thought on that, as I share this, um, in my work in foster care and our foster care rights and responsibilities, we did a graphic for the youngest ones. So I'm wondering if that's also on the table for communicating out to others. Thank you, Director Drury. This is Pat Sander, Executive Director of Coordinated School Health. Uh, part of our next steps um, is also that communication with students. Uh, for the upper grade, the middle school and high school, we have in the work plan to be developing uh, lessons for advisory. We know that some schools currently go over uh, much of this document with um, incoming ninth graders at the high school level. We've learned that over the years. and so. Uh, we will be doing that. We've also um, got plans to do some parent education uh, outreach also um, through the community this next year. And then uh, your idea of the, the graphic for the younger students, I think would sit well, but we will um, plan to work together with our community to make um, what needs to happen, um, be reflective of their needs and, and meet those. Great, thank you. I look forward to seeing it. Okay, uh, Director Rivera-Smith. Thank you. Um, no, I, I have um, not only many questions, I appreciate the updates to at, at the committee meeting. Uh, I noted there were some his and hers still in there and I see that those have been updated. So thank you for that. Um, I, I did question the distribution also at that meeting. So. Um, I, I'm really excited to hear the um, the advisory components already, you know, the, in classrooms. So that's that's good to hear too. And um, I don't have any questions of so, comments. So Thank you. Great. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, just a note uh, from a typo standpoint. There are there's one place where off campus is used as a hyphenated term and in all the other places it's used as um, two separate words. So just a note on that. Um, and then um, just to also to add, uh, oh, sorry, and on off campus, I couldn't find, is, is off campus defined in this document? what off-campus means? I would have to go back and go through the um, the document myself, but I will make a note here um, to look for that definition and um, report back. Okay, I don't think it is, at least in my search, I, I didn't find it. Um, it just simply says off-campus, and I think in particular, um, and this will lead to what my, my last question, uh, I'm not sure that that necessarily is clear that, yeah, so it doesn't, the, the document doesn't mention social media, um, and that is an off-campus place, and so um, my, I feel like we do have policy that mentions that. Um, I don't know if that's cross-reference, but that would be my big question before it comes through to action that we get that nice and clear. I will work with Erin Romanic when she gets back next week and we will um, take a look at that and see what we can do to make the clarity okay. needed. Um, and then I did wanna add um, additional uh, volume to the notion that the, um, uh, first of all, I think the formatting is really due for an update. Um, I don't know what kind of, of 
hell that would wreak in terms of getting it printed. Um, and so I apologize in advance for, for asking for this, but it is really hard to read. Um, the Just the entire um, nature of the formatting is too many words and uh, too condensed a space. Um, it's, it's just visually a struggle. Uh, the margins are too small. I don't, and I, and I don't say this just because I'm reading it here, but because I have read it in person many times. Um, and, and I, you know, with respect to when it shows up in our packets, um, coming home to, to families and it, it needs some work. It's, it's a struggle to get through it. And so to director Dury's point, um, and I think director Rankin might've mentioned some, t something about this. I don't know if this has been grade leveled, um, and when I say grade level, I don't mean um, that uh, awful program that I, the name of which I can't remember right now, which kind of, for lack of a better term, dumbs down news, uh, news ELA, that's what it's called, um, uh, which I think is a bit of a dangerous um, tool. Um, but I do have a concern that, that this isn't necessarily um, as a board, as a district, we're all pretty bad about not having good um, uh, uh, language that, that makes documents accessible, regardless of the grade level of the person reading it, in order for it to actually be something that folks want to get through, um, it needs to be at the appropriate grade level. And so maybe that's a next year project, but I just want to add to that question. And then also add the um, w one of my dreams also in addition to what is what does the school board do um a, a you know um a, a video or graphic kind of um infographic about that um i think this would be a really critical one i think director Dory's point is is really well taken that in order to make this accessible to um kids at all different levels but also accessible without necessarily having to read it um that there's a video format and i would think that there's a it's a good opportunity for kids to, if, if you haven't seen the the um, the work that was done um, uh, in conjunction with, um, well, no, you've seen the the work, um, uh, Director Sanders, on the um, consent, the the video that was done on consent by the um, directed by um, one of our former students. Um, that was just, I mean, I could watch that thing a hundred times, and it's unscripted students talking about. Um, and informing us about consent in a way that is just so impactful and, and easy to digest. And um, if we could create snippets like that around section by section for, for students' rights and responsibilities, um, and maybe that consent is even even already part of it, um, could just pop right in there, but that would be um, that would be pretty amazing. So um, so that's a request again, not meant to say, oh, here do this right now, but but um, that that's something that I think would really um, change the, the, I think this document is starting to become something that we really want to highlight. And that's a, a good opportunity to, or a good way to, to do that and to involve the students um, in doing that. And, and clearly they're, they're beyond capable of communicating this information in a digestible manner as we have seen them do. Um, so uh, the last question is today, the Supreme, there was a Supreme Court ruling and I asked um, previously had had reached out and and asked if we could get um, some input from Chief Narver about um, the impact of the today's Supreme Court ruling on the extent to which, as and that goes back to the off campus comment that I made. So in in looking at the how we can hold students accountable for harassment, intimidation, bullying, um, uh, sexual assault, all those things, um, racism that they do uh, that might happen. Uh, um, among students, two students um, off campus, quote unquote, um, and our ability to uh, um, hold hold students accountable for that. Um, I wanted to know if, if there was an impact of this, the Supreme Court decision that allowed us to um, today um, enhance that language. Because I have heard um, as recently as this past year from um, central office staff in, in work, working with students on, on areas of discipline that Seattle Public Schools, um, anything that happens outside of the school building isn't in fact something that, that students can be held accountable for. 
and I feel like the language here has gotten stronger um, and that the I, I would like to know um, the extent to which we can get really clear on that um, in terms of setting expectations. Um, and I think that definition, the off-campus de definition would help, but I would love to hear from um, Chief Narver about um, that, that question um, that's very recent news, if you're willing. Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, good afternoon, this is uh, Greg Narver, Chief Legal Counsel. As President Hampson noted, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision today, uh, eight to one uh, decision. The um, First of all, I, I want to note that the language we're talking about in the student rights and responsibilities document that's relevant to this is on the bottom of page 14, which uh, begins with the statement that the district will respond to off-campus student speech that causes or threatens to cause a substantial disruption on campus or interferes with the right of students to be secure and obtain their education. Uh, that statement is certainly consistent with existing First Amendment case law. And my initial read of today's decision is we, I don't think we need to change that. Uh, I don't think we need to change that, but we might look at tweaking it a little bit. Uh, for context, the uh, case that was issued today involved a high school student in Pennsylvania. She had tried out for the varsity cheerleading squad, didn't make it, was assigned to junior varsity, and off campus in a coffee shop away from campus on a weekend, not in school uh, hours, posted something on Snapchat where she expressed extreme displeasure about that in, in profane terms. And the result was that the school suspended her from the junior varsity cheerleading team for a year. The, the lower courts found this was a violation of her First Amendment rights and the U.S. Supreme Court agreed. What the majority opinion says is there are circumstances under which it's appropriate for schools to regulate off-campus speech. Uh, and so it certainly can't be the rule that anything that happens off-campus um, is beyond the uh, reach of our schools to uh, to regulate. The uh, Justice Breyer noted in his opinion that some several examples, one is severe bullying, threats aimed at teachers or students, participation in online school activities, an interesting question as to whether that's really on campus or off campus, especially after a year of, of being remote, uh, or hacking into school computers. Those were examples that the court listed of off campus speech or conduct that a school can regulate reasonably without violating the First Amendment. But I think the, the heart of the test remains did this off-campus speech result in substantial disruption to activities within the school? If so, you're certainly getting uh, closer to things that, this, that the uh, district has a, a legitimate interest in regulating. Um, I've not made it all the way through the court's opinion yet. It's brand new. I will do that before this comes up for a vote on action. Uh, again, my first impression is we don't need to change any wording in here, but uh, it's possible that some tweaks may be appropriate in light of what the Supreme Court said today. Thank you, uh, Chief Narver. Um, so, um, uh, Dr. Pedrosa and uh, Director Sander, I, my uh, request um, and consistent with um, Chief Narver's uh, um, commitment is that uh, we take this clarity of, of legal opinion and use it as a way to um, make sure that, that we are, in fact, as clear as we can possibly be, um, particularly in light of um, the fact that, uh, and if there's any, you know, additional clarity or enhancements, that, that I do think that there's some, uh, and having directly experienced sort of a, a lack of understanding of that maybe in buildings and how important it is that uh, administrators and, and staff understand exactly what this means because it is a, as um, Chief Narver stated, it, it has become um, almost an everyday question um, and uh, management topic. And I think the extent to which we can be really clear here is going to save um, our uh, building staff and administrators um, a lot of headache and heartache. So, and, and I'll, I'll stop talking and, and let you all respond and, and then we can move on. No, I was just going to respond that this is, thank you for bringing this up. And so we'll work very closely with Chief Narver to make sure that we incorporate or adjust any language that's needed to be adjusted. And then I'll just add one more thing that I, I am just, I'm, what I'm thinking about 
is um, we're actually thinking about uplifting some of the responding to hate and bias uh, procedural pieces and so making sure that there's alignment in that as well so I, I, I hear what you're saying um, so we're just got to figure out how to make sure that the language is in alignment with the recent ruling and then in addition um, making sure that it's very clear what procedurals procedures are for school staff in making some of those decisions and where to go next in terms of support uh, for the students and families because um, as we all know that there has been an increase of incidents that actually have impacted school communities. And we just wanna make sure that school teams have a, a very clear, succinct and concise language and procedures aligned to that. So yes, we'll make sure and address some of that. And we can we can work on that. Thank you. I don't know if Pat, uh, uh, Ms. Sanders, do you have, wanna have anything to add? No, I'm 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 with you. We'll, we'll move in that vein with Chief Narver and, and um, work with Aaron, yes. Thank you. Great, thank you all so very, very much. Um, and 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 not to be too, um, you know, demeaning about the <laughs> the um, sort of the typesetting or that that's old terminology, but <laughs> the font and all that. Um, I think we're just new for maybe it's just because I've seen it for too many years, but um, that that probably goes for a lot of parents as well. So. No, and I, I think it's a it's a it's a good thing to address, and we are about continuous improvement, and part of our continuous improvement mindset is about making sure that it that it meets the needs of everyone. So thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you so very much. Uh, I know that this document is a lot of work, so, um, and appreciate the ongoing commitment to making it um, better for our students and, and, and sincere gratitude for the community engagement on it as well. And to all of those community members that willingly gave of their time and mental and emotional energy to, uh, um, and staff to, to continue to make this a, a better document. It is absolutely critical. And I know you all um, are really committed to it. Okay, so um, going to try to move us along. We've got lots of big stuff, but we'll try to keep us moving along. Um, introduction item number two, adoption of board policy number 6902, information technology planning. This came through student supports curriculum instruction on June 8th and is, uh, is uh, being brought forward today for consideration. Um, Director of Technology Infrastructure, Nancy Peterson, I believe you'll be briefing us. Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, so this board action requ report requests approval and adoption of the new board policy number 6902. This policy provides requirements for information technology to plan and prepare an implementation plan for the district. Currently, the district has no policy in place regarding governance addressing the technology planning for the district. And so the purpose of this policy is to provide the requirements for that, that process and the instructions for preparing a technology plan. Um, we acknowledge that the board recognizes the importance of information technology planning that centers the needs of center of students to provide the learning technology and support systems that students and education and educators need for the highest pilot quality public education experience possible. The uh, Technology Advisory Committee, ITAC, collaborated in drafting the proposed board policy. ITAC met multiple times uh, and help develop and incorporate some critical requirements into this policy. The um, ITAC has representation from staff, students, teachers, and community members, and families and other technology organizations. So their contributions were instrumental in making sure that we had the feedback and the voice of our community in the governance process. So the policy uh, emphasizes at one point the need for our technology to address the usability and accessibility for our best user experience. That was a big part of the recommendation from the ITAC committee in putting this together. So the policy basically describes how to develop the plan um, that is to be done in conjunction with our levy planning. This happens every three years and the policy lays out that it will be developed within um, or ensuring that that we adhere to other board policies. For example, the educational and 
racial equity policy, the responsible and effective use of technology, the policy that uh, that um, outlines electronic resources and the use of the internet, and also the environmental responsibility. Um, and so the policy outlines how we develop a technology implementation plan that then comes to the board for review. We created this policy at the time in that started in 2020 when a similar policies were reviewed that were created for the um, capital implementation. And um, it was determined that technology needed a similar kind of governance process and requirements for that planning. So this is in relation to that. I would be happy to address any questions that the board might have at this point. Thank you, Nancy. Um, let me start first with Director Rankin, uh, Chair of Student Services Curriculum and Instruction. Director Rankin. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, hi, Nancy. Um, as mentioned, this is a, a new policy that addresses um, this need. Uh, and when we, we had a good discussion about it in committee, um, and then I, I did get a couple questions from um, board directors about, you know, really focusing on, on student needs and, and a little bit of I don't, confusion is not exactly the right word, but but how, how trying to con contextualize it, I think in in terms of um, uh, centering on students, but but making sure that it didn't sort of uh, drift away from the the intent, which is to drive the planning um, for for building levy asks and stuff. Um, and so thanks so much to staff for setting up two by twos um, to brief board directors. Um, I haven't had a chance to hear back from anyone on, on how those went, if, if folks got their question answered. Um, uh, I I guess I'll just say for the, the record what I think is really important about this and what came up last year, I think, in talking about doing this is that um, for me as a board director and particularly as the chair of student services curriculum and instruction, um, it's it's critical that as we do technology planning, for classroom technology, um, we we are, we make sure that we're aligned with what's happening in teaching and learning, and that the needs of the students and educators are what drives our 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 purchases and decision making in terms of technology, as opposed to you know uh, an arbitrary schedule or a oh a new technology just came out let's let's buy it and then um, you know and then here here you go teachers and then their teaching is sort of being driven by technology instead of um, technology responding to what they need in the classroom so um, it's been um, it, it's it's been great to see this and um, especially appreciate itac's involvement i think that's critical something that has come up that other directors may mention or not is in the broader picture of us looking at how existing what existing policies are and trying to really focus our governance on the big picture and not get too into what really should be staff work um, my question now for for staff and i think just all of us is the context of what's in this policy is it better or stronger to put it <laughs> is a whole new policy the right place and that's i'm that's a genuine question i think the information and the thought that's in this is is definitely needed and super valuable but i'm thinking about context and where i'm starting to think about policy in general is that um if nancy and carlos were to disappear <laughs> Um, and uh, and there wasn't continuity in terms of staffing. Would our policy support the continuation of the work um, with the intent that we all have right now? Um, and I, I'm kind of thinking out loud about that right now because I don't know the answer. I'm genuinely asking. I sort of put it forward as as this is an item for introduction, putting that forward for us to think about um, in the broader context of 
our policy work, knowing that there are outdated policies and um, sort of some policies that really trickles into uh, the work of staff instead of the work of the board. Where does this sit in that um, in terms of being a, a new policy um, and, and how do we make sure that it, it does what it's um, intended to do in terms of focusing um, planning on the needs of students and, and separating that from infrastructural technology for, you know, uh, Seattle Public Schools as an organization. So um, <laughs> just putting that out there, um, um, I guess, for uh, leading into this discussion and, and see what other other directors um, want to ask or know. One thing that I might just address, um, it's a great it's a great question and a discussion point. I'm sure the other directors might have some observations to make. What I would say from my perspective is that as staff turns over, I think this is one of the reasons why it is good to have a policy like this. It's not only staff turnover in the department, it's also leadership turnover and board turnover. And I think a policy allows us to have a bit more continuity in planning and expectations. So um, some of the wording in here was, was edited to give more emphasis to the fact that we are really focusing our planning on the needs of students and educators as we get that input and feedback from those different community stakeholders. And I think it's important to have that codified in a policy. Um, we have been, as a department, writing our own implementation plans because as part of the whole levy planning process and board approval, we have to do planning anyway to figure out how much we'll need to fund. And this is not just focused on student and educator and user technology. This really encompasses all of the technology planning that's done for all of our investments in the organization. So it does include um, planning for cybersecurity provisions for the network, for um, support, for staffing, for um, all of our back office systems, for our student information systems, as well as all of the end user computing devices. Um, all of those things, though, do support student education. And I think um, having a having a policy that directs us to articulate that keeps us accountable to those constituents and also keeps that consistency throughout. So that's that's my view. OK, um, thank you and we'll now go to uh, director. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Directors um, that have questions, please either raise your hand or um, turn your screen on, or both. Hi. So I, I think I just have a quick question. Um, because we, we did have those two by twos, which I really appreciated um, to get a deeper understanding of the uh, proposed policy here. I'm wondering how much, so this is strictly to dictate our spending on infrastructure. Is that how I should understand it? Um, but there are lots of technology decisions to be made as far as like um, uh, curriculum use of, of, of technology and, and applications. Is there, where's, where's the part that's going to kind of oversee or plan out to that side of it? Is, it, is that in, is that proposed, is that what this is going to be planning this out? This will be, yeah, this will be comprehensive. It will be all technology, not just infrastructure. Okay. Okay. And so is that, in, and again, like I, I said this out of two days, so I say again, but um, there's no approval of the plan, this plan that is to be, be developed. Um, I don't know. I mean, I might be the only director who's uh, slightly concerned with that, but I I wonder it is going to go through a committee. Is that committee is, is that is that a place where we can look to to affect it if we have concerns? I'm not quite sure I got your question. Um, 
I, I think my headset may be cut out a little bit. Okay, might be too. I'm just wondering because it's not a not this the plan that will be created by this policy is not up for approval, right? It's not to be approved by the board. Oh. Right. So the only place we really can affect it, that as it's developed when it comes out is in that committee where it will be brought just for um, discussion, I take it? it yes. Um, we do, however, have um, the plan to, to create a superintendent procedure that that could have more of that information in it. Um, the way this policy is written currently, it would come to the board for um, uh, to be presented and discussed in that committee. It does not come to the full board for approval as it is written today. Um, my understanding is that there, if you compare this to say the capital planning process and their implementation plan, they do bring that to the board for approval. And as a result um, of their getting that approval sort of ahead of time for all of their plans for uh, investment, then their um, pre-approval level, as you, if you will, is higher. It's a $5 million level for the technology uh, policies, we are still um, held to bring any investment uh, expectations or any projects to the board for specific approval if they are over a million dollars. So it's a little different in the board then gets to approve any of the projects that come off of that plan before they are um, before they are purchased or before they are pursued. Gotcha, I understand. Okay, and, and yeah, those are just my my questions. Um, it's my small concerns here, but I, I I hear you, and I and I don't want to muck up the process. I know we want to keep everything well oiled, um, and we will see it in, in committee. So um, that does that does give me that uh, solace. So thank you. No other questions or comments. Okay. Any other directors have comments, questions, concerns? Um, and I, I think so I'll go ahead um, with I think my my only concern at this point is uh, that I appreciate the the updates um, definitely took note of them and and can see the attempts to make sure the uh, to provide some clarity and um, uh, you know I think that this is definitely uh, of great import and uh, incredibly well uh, and, and thoughtful and, and sincere appreciation to ITAC. I think the creation of that committee is a great resource um, and uh, want us to consider and other venues, whether that needs to continue reporting to the executive committee. Um, we have some stuff to figure out in terms of what needs to come where when, when something is so um, ubiquitously relevant throughout the district and is then only gonna be coming to SSCNI um, that's something that we as a board have to deal with um, because of what our what we have now created as our um, as our committee structure where we have so much shoved into two committees that then doesn't rise to the level of, of board reporting and um, limits kind of um, some of the two-way conversation that we should be having so my my last request would be um, and before we move this to action um, is that one, we know clearly how this plays into the notion of, of um, student outcomes as they will be, um, be directly associated with goals in the strategic plan um, and not, not the um, specific goals, but any stated strategic plan goals um, so that it, it has some continuity beyond a, a, a stated strategic plan. And then also um, that we might consider given some work that the board's going to be doing over the summer on policies. Um, you know, it could be a chicken or egg thing, but whether or not we wait to approve this until August when we have better reference points for it um, or, or might start to. That, that's that's my only um, concern is, is the timing if, if we're not a little tiny bit too early on this um, with the idea that once we approve, once we um, have moved towards fuller implementation of student outcomes focused governance, um, we might be able to, to um, uh, have 
a more structured response to this. I think we're all a bit reticent right now um, in a period where we're trying to, to be on more of a policy diet of you know creating more policy and yet also want to honor and respect the, um, as you, I thought you explained that quite well, Nancy, in terms of, you know, why here, why, and why this? Um, and then my last question would be, you know, why right now? And so um, that that's all I have left. But in, you know, in general, I'm definitely supportive of, of the, the planning. I know it's something that has been um, a need expressed by board directors and by staff for quite some time. Um, and feel free, I don't know if you want to add, if you want to respond at all to that, Nancy, but. Um, the timing, I think, is as a result of um, the the planning that we're doing right now for the upcoming levy request. Yeah. And this is really um, kind of interwoven with that. Yeah. As I had mentioned, we do as as just part of planning for the the levy, we end up looking at every facet of computing to see what needs we have out there. And so as part of that planning that we're doing already for our portion of the levy ask for BTA5, um, we have already started drafting an implementation plan that um, we've gotten a lot of input from all of the department chiefs, um, and from uh, various stakeholder groups. I, I know the public member that spoke in public comments about um, making sure that assistive technology and special education was a portion of what was included in the planning. Um, and that certainly is a big part of our planning every levy. And so that planning is taking place right now. We've already started drafting an implementation plan that we believe would, would come as a result of this policy. So the timing is really sort of interlaced just because of where we are in our levy planning cycle. I don't know that approval changes that. And so I, I don't know that, at least from a staff perspective, that we have um, a big need for approval at any certain time. I think the board has leeway to really decide when that makes the most sense. Okay, that's super helpful. Great. Okay, so um, having heard no other um, director comments, questions, and concerns, um, thank you, Nancy and Carlos, and um, your staff for um, working on this and, and bringing this before us. Thank you. And I should say, I'm really sorry Carlos couldn't present this today. His oh, I understand. Is is bothering him? I know it. Um, he has done so much work on this. He was yes. he was really eager to see this presented. Thank and you. we did get to hear from him in, in two by twos and he was barely getting the the the, the words to be um, audible then. <laughs> so yeah. um, we appreciate, we hope he will get well and um, look forward to talking to him soon. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move to introduction item number three, acceptance of federal funding for um, Head Start grant annual renewal. Um, this is an annual renewal. This came through um, Student Services Curriculum and Instruction on June 8th and is presented for approval. Chief Academic Officer Dr. Keisha Scarlett, I believe you will be briefing us. Hello, how are you all? Good afternoon. Um, so good evening, um, directors. I'm very happy to introduce this item to you as discussed at the June 8th Student Services Curriculum and Instruction Committee meeting. This board action report, if approved, would support renewing the Head Start grant as well as expanding programming through the addition of SPP funds to um, our four-part day program to for, from our four-day four-part day programs to full day. Excuse me. Head Start is a long-standing um, preschool program in our district serving since 1965 when it was brought to the district by Aki Kurosi herself. Head Start prioritizes and continues to serve preschool students furthest from educational justice. Its goal is to boost school readiness of children who qualify for preschool based on income and program guidelines. Under the leadership of the Early Learning Department, this program has expanded the opportunities for research-based and inclusive all-day preschool programming 
by creating Head Start Plus this last year. In alignment with our Seattle Excellence Strategic Plan, early learning's priorities include increasing opportunities in our 13 focus schools, Title I schools, Head Start full day programming, and inclusive special education opportunities throughout the district. Our focus is to ensure safe, warm, and engaging high quality early learning environments that develop, that develop the talents, identity, voice, and agency of our students furthest from educational justice with the focus on African American boys. Through the creation of the talent development plans and asset based instruction and culturally responsive family and student engagement. Our Head Start program looks forward to ensuring that our youngest learners in the district have opportunities for a strong start to their educational journey. This bar designates funding and support to the Head Start grant that will be in effect um, November 2021. Because of the timeline of the federal grant submittal system and the coordination of the district um, calendar, the school district calendar, the final application materials will not be fully prepared until mid-July. This $6,629,437 investment will fund capacity for 335 students, programming in 18 classes, spread over 12 sites in elementary schools in the north, southeast, and southwest areas of the city. Each of the 18 classes serves 20 children, and one predominantly three-year-old class serves 17 children. Expansion of the four part day programs to full day while utilizing SPP funding will happen at Northgate Elementary, Martin Luther King Junior Elementary School, Cascadia Elementary, and also Wing Luke Elementary. All children who receive district will receive district transportation and other supports such as nutrition, wellness, health and safety, and direct family support through our family services coordinators. The Policy Council, which is an advisory board of Head Start parents, continues to be an important part of this um, program. So I'll end my comments and just remind us that we have um, Cashel Toner, who is our Executive Director of, um, of um, Curriculum Assessment Instruction here. And also I want to highlight that just this um, afternoon we got some really insightful questions um, from um, Director Rivera-Smith that we're looking forward to scheduling a meeting with you, Director Rivera-Smith. Um, um, along with myself, Heather Brown and Cashel to really talk about those questions because I think they're really essential in this effort that we're lifting up. Thank you. Okay, and we'll go first to uh, Director Rankin, um, Chair of Student Services Curriculum and Instruction. Thank you. Um, yeah, this uh, we had a good conversation about this in committee. This is a renewal of a longstanding program, um, but something that Dr. Scarlett touched on and that we mentioned in or we talked about in committee um, that is really positive is more opportunities for um, inclusion in early learning. I you know, personally think every every preschool site should be fully inclusive and available for students with or without and without disabilities. Um, uh, so any progress towards towards making that more of a reality is very, very welcome. Um, in the again, in the broader context about uh, what comes through committee and, and looking at our, our work and um, uh, um, student centered governance. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier that our committee meeting this last time was really long and packed with a lot of stuff. So not specifically to this item, but just in general, I think although we had a good discussion in committee because this item is a renewal um, that it it maybe we didn't need that's slightly duplicative. We could have maybe just had that conversation together today for introduction. So I'm just kind of putting that out there and thinking about, you know, um, trying to preserve staff time and effort in, in presenting and and also um, to you, President Hampson, um, as we're thinking about, you know, what what things come through committee and what things could go right through the board, right through to the full board, something like this um, that is a renewal, uh, that there's conversation that, you know, we could all have together, maybe, um, I don't know, that's just something for us to think about how, uh, um, 
I don't know that this needed to come through committee, I guess I'm saying, but um, not because I don't love hearing about it. <laughs> um, it's obviously really positive and I um, am a huge supporter, uh, but just thinking about, you know, staff time and board time and all of that. Um, but yeah, I am, well, I'm happy to pass it to the next director. I don't have any, any questions. Okay, um, any other directors have comments, questions, or concerns about this introduction item number three? Hi, um, so I just wanted to add, so thank you. Um, well, after I'll back up for a second. So as the, as the um, our, board, our Head Start board liaison, I really appreciate the work that's gone into this, even the application itself, I know it is a, is a big lift and the program as a whole, it really, it really does just embody our vision and values as we work for students for the educational justice, a um, few things uplift them like the Head Start program. So it's really dear to my heart and I thank you. Uh, Dr. Scarlett, for your recognition of my questions, I do look forward to um, speaking with you and Executive Director Toner, um, just for the benefit of the board, just um, so they, uh, they weren't really questions direct to this bar, so I don't want to want to bog down this conversation and meeting with them. There are um, more questions regarding bell times. Um, I wanted to see if we're going to be aligning those with the school buildings because I, I, I feel like that is something that will really benefit the program. And some questions about staffing, about inclusion, because it really that is really just something we should be highlighting with our Head Start program is the efforts towards more inclusive classrooms and full day classrooms for that matter. But um, I really thank um, the Director Brown, Heather Brown, for her work towards building those inclusive classrooms. Um, I guess that is a small question there is, is when and what is the pathway to more of those? Because I, you know, we, I see the increase and that's great to see it. Will we be expecting um, you know, more a Head Start inclusion? I guess it's called Head Start Plus classrooms in the future. Um, we can hold that question for a second there. My other questions were um, about enrollment uh, or what was the plan for fall enrollment? And then one question which I have explored with uh, Chief Berge in the past is about the indirect fees um, because they do take a big bite out of this grant. Um, so I, I look forward to having more discussion on that. Um, but yeah, those were those are kind of things that, um, like again, more details that aren't really direct to this bar. So no reason to, to bog this, this conversation down with that, but I, I look forward to uh, more discussion with the, the early learning team. Thank you. Yeah, I'll invite um, uh, Executive Director Toner to um, maybe address about the um, the expansion. Um, we are eager um, for expansion. And then I did share a little bit of information about enrollment. And so um, our funded enrollment is 357 for the 19, uh, for the, that was the 1920 um, school year. So the funded enrollment was 357 and the actual enrollment this year is um, 245. And so, um, I did share before that that they, yeah before that the capacity is 357 in this program and in 18 um, classes that spread over 12 sites across the elementary and north southeast and southwest areas of the city. Yeah, and I think the question was more just about um, as you know it was just more of are we going is there going to be a, a, any sort of expanded push for enrollment yeah. in the fall? Did yeah. they take a hit this last everything did right? absolutely. Um, Shell, what thoughts do you have about that? Yeah. I'd be happy to address that. Good evening, directors. Um, Kishel Turner, Executive Director for Curriculum Instruction. Huge thanks to my colleagues, um, Dr. Scarlett and Heather Brown, who have been instrumental in thinking through how we can lift up our Head Start program and continue to um, get to our vision of someday. And this speaks to your, que uh, your question, um, uh, Director Rivera-Smith, of having preschool programming in Seattle Public Schools and not um, you know, different categorical programs across our system. So, Potentially someday, the long-term vision is to work on a um, sometimes referred to the back back end or behind the curtain a little bit um, to distribute funds where children and meet them where they are. Um, and uh, so that's our long-term vision would be to continue with expansion. Head Start actually has a really strong model around inclusion, and they have metrics around how many children um, are expected to be included in the larger program. Um, so we use that as a, a north star, but all of our classrooms um, in my future state for our preschool programming in Seattle Public Schools would be inclusive classrooms for preschool kids. So what I mean by that is moving away from saying Head Start this or Seattle Preschool Program that or developmental preschool this, have preschool where children are and be able to meet their needs um, in their school communities. Um, 
with a thought toward children being able to transition right up to kindergarten um, in their neighborhoods where they have friends and community. So that's a long-term vision. It's gonna take some partnership to get there uh, because right now preschool is um, really categorically funded and we're very fortunate to be in a city um, that does support our preschool programming. So that's a long way around that. Um, yes, we did have some challenges during COVID with preschool enrollment and we have um, some specific plans and uh, to target enrollment outreach to specific communities um, and, and try to really increase that enrollment before we start school. So those plans are in the works um, and I'm actually pretty excited about that work. Okay, thank you, yeah. And because if I'm reading the bar correctly, we're talking about inclusion. Um, it sounds like only 6% of our Head Start students are special ed and I believe our district is close to the 13. So I don't know if that's due to lack of seats for them or lack of students applying with to receive special ed services. So, um, it just, you know, just match our district. Yeah, so. you're correct, and we're we're we're, we're working on that. And as we continue to braid programming and um, not compete with ourselves for children to be in one kind of classroom or a different kind of classroom, then our our statistics will probably look a little bit different. But as a system, we're serving children with special needs that are in preschool. But um, it just depends on exactly where they're being served. Our long term vision, as I said, is to have more inclusive programming that's preschool for children in Seattle Public Schools. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your time. No further questions or comments. Okay. Uh, any other, Director Rankin, you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks. I, I um, just kind of wanted to chime in on something that Director Rivera Smith said about um, the percentages there and that part of, part of why um, inclusive early learning is so critical is because a lot of times a disability isn't identified until a child is in preschool. Um, and so some of the reasons, well, some of the reason that number is smaller than the general population is because it's hard to find accessible um, inclusive pre preschool spaces right now. Um, but it's also because a student um, may not have yet been identified. And when we build these more inclusive spaces and we have um, supportive staff who are are ready to sort of identify and notice um, a challenge or a student in need of more support. Um, you know, there's 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 students who are who are just um, yeah, <laughs> that number is lower because a student has not yet been identified and will as they develop. You know, under age six and um, different things come forward and um, different needs are made known. So just throwing that out there again has. <laughs> Uh, extra support for inclusion in, in all of those spaces. Sure, Director Rankin, thank you. Uh, this is Heather Brown, Director of Early Learning, and uh, I would like to report that we do have our two Head Start Plus programs that we started this year, and unfortunately we started them in a pandemic, and so and it was when our overall enrollment with, as a district was down, and so it was challenging to fill those classes as robustly as we wanted to. So we're really looking forward for so many reasons, getting back in person, not only being able to serve our kids a uh, full day in person, but also really bolster up these Head Start Plus programs. And then, as you know, we are really putting our, our Head Start classrooms side by side with our special education classrooms to do a lot of collaborative learning at our new sites. And so uh, we're really, I think, on our way to, uh, as, as um, Executive Director Toner had said, around really just blending, braiding our funding together to really um, become just a, a, a leader in the nation around uh, early learning. Looking forward to it. Okay, moving right along. Um... There's no other questions, comments, or concerns on this. We will go to introduction item number four. And um, that is approval of the 2021 to 22 Maxim Healthcare Services contract. RFQ 02, oh, I just lost it. RFQ 02758. This came through SSCNI Student Services Curriculum and Instruction on June 8th and is recommended for approval. Associate Superintendent Pedrosa, I believe you will be briefing us. Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, put in front of you this bar uh, for your approval um, regarding the contract for uh, with Maxim Health Services. Uh, this contract is in the amount of $2 million and it requires uh, board approval moving forward. 
Uh, currently, uh, this is serving uh, students, Seattle Public School students with IEPs that require special education services that the district is unable to provide uh, without contracted behavioral technicians and board certified behavioral analysts uh, support. Um, the number of students requiring these services has increased uh, following the return to in-person services due to the change from remote to in-person learning. These services will for support individual student needs as, as part of the student's IEP. And um, it will also provide recovery services as well as compensatory services to students to address learning loss that was accrued during the 2020, um, 2021 school year. Um, we have Director Tara Mitchell here to address any questions and um, thank you. Okay, we'll go first to Director Rankin for any comments, questions, or concerns as uh, the Chair of uh, Student Services Curriculum and Instruction. Uh, nope, this is another another one that probably could have bypassed committee um, and, and had us all have the benefit of having the discussion at the same time as it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a need for staffing to um, provide uh, recovery services. Um, after the pandemic. So glad that we can find a way to make this happen because I know how much our, um, uh, well, it's summer, so some people are not on contract, um, but also going into the fall, you know, caseloads and, and workloads are, are pretty high. So to make sure that all students have their needs met um, and uh, it's manageable, uh, got to do it. <laughs> Okay, any comments or questions, concerns from other directors, please uh, turn on your camera and or raise your hand. Okay, Director Dury. Yeah, just one real quick question. Are we expecting uh, more to identify more students who will be needing these services as we come back from the fall? And if so, is that embedded in the contract or will we need more money to, to cover that? Yeah, so uh, we actually have set aside through the ESSER funds additional resources to support recovery services and compensatory services, uh, which will include expanded contracts. So you might see another contract come forward. It'll also include extra staffing. It'll in, it includes um, extra time for staff. And so we have actually started that process uh, currently working with staff. We actually had all of our uh, staff uh, notify families uh, about having these conversations. We have some families that have indicated they do wanna have the conversation about recovery services, but they want to wait until fall. They want to break right now, but we actually have some families that are starting. We are actually have expanded our summer um, opportunities um, and learning opportunities. We have several programs and services. Uh, so we currently have a large number, a larger number of students being served this summer. Uh, one example of that is extended school year. So we've added more students to extended serv services. We've, extend we've extended the number of, of a much uh, the number of days of students being served, as well as uh, maybe um, uh, extended uh, days and times for students, depending on the services that are required to support them. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a multi prong approach. Um, but we have some families that are starting now, some families that are postponing. Um, it's for over two years, so we most likely might be coming ahead in front of you again if we have to expand or need to increase contracts or additional services, but we are currently in that process. Uh, Mitch, uh, Director Mitchell, do you have anything to add? No, ma'am, that sums it up. Uh, Director Drury, did I ask, answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like we're prepared to to accept yeah. more students as needed and that we have money set aside to address that if we need to. And that was yes. it. Thank you. Yep, we do. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other comments, questions, or concerns. We will move now. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Mitchell and uh, Assistant Superintendent Pedrosa, and um, we will move now to introduction item number five. 
approval of agreements with uh, Seattle Department of Transportation and Cascade Bicycle Club to fund and provide the Let's Go and Let's Go Further Bike Pedestrian Safety Education Programs. This came through Student Services Curriculum and Instruction on June 8th and is presented here for approval. Chief Scarlett, I believe you'll be briefing us. All right, let's go. So good evening, um, directors. Um, Dr. Keisha Scarlett, Chief Academic Officer. I'm joined tonight by Kachelle Toner, our Executive Director of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction. Um, this is Lori Dunn, our wonderful physical education manager. And Ronald Boy, I'm not sure if he's still here, but um, senior counsel from our legal team. In addition, we have several community partners from the Seattle Department of Transportation and Cascade Bike Club here this evening. Thanks to all of you for your ongoing efforts to make this partnership possible. I'd like to recognize Ms. Ashley Reed, um, Seattle Department of Transportation, um, Mr. Stephen Rowley from Cascade Bike Club, um, Mr. Christopher Sh Shannon from um, Cascade Bike Club, Ms. Amy Corver for also from Cascade Bike Club, um, Ms. Alicia McConnell, Outdoors for All, and also Mr. Ed Bronson, um, Bronston, excuse me, Outdoors for All. Let's go and let's go further. Um, Board Action Bar was reviewed by the Student Services Curriculum and Instruction Committee on June 8th and was moved forward with a recommendation for approval by the full board. This board action report details two agreements, one with the Seattle Department of Transportation, the Grand Tour, and one with Cascade Bicycle Club as a service provider to continue the Let's Go and Let's Go Further Bike and Pedestrian Safety education program to elementary K through eight middle school students for the next five school years. The program's cost total over five years is just over $2 million, which SDOT will provide to the district to pay Cascade Bike Club for their services. The partnership with SDOT and Cascade Bicycle Clubs provides funds for training, equipment, materials, and services needed to provide programming. Physical education teachers are provided with resources and training for the in-school bike and pedestrian safety program for elementary and middle school students. This allows educators to meet students at their skill level with differentiated lessons in the physical education classrooms. Health professionals recommend that students get 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity each day. And students who walk and bike to school are more likely to get the recommended 60 minutes. Students who learn the proper skills and ride their bikes to schools can, act, can actively utilize the skills learned in this program. Cascade Bright Club trains and supports physical education specialists to provide the three-week unit in grades three through five Let's Go program. The physical education teacher signs up to borrow a fleet of 30 bikes, helmets, and equipment delivered via bike trailer. This program has evolved and improved since its inception. I'll share a few of those things about the expansion and the redesign. So in 2016, we started the Let's Go partnership. In 2019, we actually adapted, um, added the adapted component in working with Outdoors for All, our partners. Outdoors for All is a national leader in delivering adaptive and therapeutic recreation for children and, and adults with disabilities. Outdoors for All's program includes snowboarding, snowshoeing, cross country, downhill skiing, cycling, mountain biking, kayaking, hiking, rock climbing, youth and adult day camps, yoga, military programs, weekend excursions, and custom events. In 2020, this program was expanded to actually include middle schools. The pilot was started. Then there we met with challenges associated with COVID-19 pandemic. So we added a video learning support to help meet teachers' needs during pandemic. So um, we did engage um, in an equity analysis around this and the equity analysis tool was provided an opportunity for us to really recognize racially equitable outcomes of the Let's Go program. In alignment with the Seattle Excellence Strategic Plan, our um, bike distribution will prioritize students furthest from educational justice by beginning with equity tier one and tier two schools. These schools will receive priority scheduling and additional volunteers will be made available if needed. As far as um, with regard to community engagement um, in reference to policy 4265, our community partnership policy, 
The Seattle School Board's policy is to create partnerships between SPS schools and the community. The board believes it is vital to engage families and community members in the life of the school of a community center of learning. Therefore, the board is committed to creating and implementing effective school community partnerships that enhance academic outcomes by providing high quality services and instruction before and after and during the school day. And so we seek to um, foster a partnership that furthers our district vision and mission. So in collaboration with the elementary Let's Go Bike and Pedestrian Program, we're set to begin a partnership in delivering the content and outdoor school and due to return to in-person instructions required by the governor in the state of Washington, we shifted away from these plans. During this pandemic and since last March, the physical education program manager continued to meet every two weeks to offer check-ins with Cascade Bike Club leadership. This time was used to update, network, and continue to create a partnership community. Um, lastly, we'd like to thank the um, Major Taylor Project, um, which is an extracurricular program that is offered beyond the school day and continues to expand. This program is named after the African-American world champion cyclist Marshall Major Taylor. The Major Taylor Project, MTP, empowers young um, youth through bicycling and after-school bicycling clubs. MTP students explore their communities, build confidence and leadership skills, and discover their power to affect change. Um, this program reaches more than 500 youth um, annually in middle school and high schools across King County and Pierce counties. And um, residents, um, excuse me, in five schools are currently participants in this um, project. Um, and we hope to expand with continued implementation and the, the sustaining of Let's Go and Let's Go Further Bikes. Those schools are T South High School, Cleveland High School, Denny International Middle School, Franklin High School, and Rainier Beach. So all this work benefits Seattle um, student learning and supports in Seattle excellence. And we continue to authentically engage with the goal and match our strategic plan, focusing on black excellence and equity in our community engagement and partnerships. Thank you so much for all of that time to share that. I thought it was very important and um, we'll take any questions. And we do have um, our program manager again, Lori Dunn, and also executive director, um, Kishel Toner is here as well. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Director Rankin, Chair of Student Services um, Curriculum Instruction. Um, thank you. Yeah, this is um, uh, another one that I think is um, uh, pretty easily supported <laughs> um, and, and probably could have just come to the full board, maybe not, um, not through committee, um, as it is a continuation and an expansion of some existing partnerships and existing programming. Um, I am really excited about the opportunity for more students to to move and get outside. Um, I also wonder how we might, uh, you know, uh, some schools might overlap and dovetail this with, you know, as as physical education, but also as an opportunity for, you know, biking field trips or, you know, visits to different sites. That's sort of um, exciting potential. Um, uh, as student transportation um, to other opportunities as well in the future. Um, uh, I know nope, I don't have any other questions or comments. Um, you know, it takes a lot of coordination to get all of this going. So um, I'm just excited that this is going to be available still and to more more and more students. So thanks for bringing it forward. OK, any other comments, questions or concerns from other directors? Hi, just uh, one quick question, just to be clear, does the program provide the bicycles or do students, are they expected to have their own bikes and helmets and everything? Hi, Director Rivera Smith, Kishel Toner again. Um, the program provides the bicycles, so it's a fleet of bikes and um, helmets um, and other tools um, to see, you know, there's some work in the adaptive space. So. Um, we do some coordination there to see what sort of modifications might need to be made to a bicycle um, in advance of the fleet actually arriving in, imagine a big trailer uh, coming to a school. And then that trailer is there while the um, phys physical education teacher uses the bikes for a set period of time. Um, and then they're, um, you know, sort of um, 
maintained and then they move on to the next school. We do have a prioritization where our schools um, in different equity tiers get priority in signing up for when they would like to use the bikes um, according to their uh, local school context. So that's kind of how it works. Thank you. And I remember in previous year, I guess maybe it was a year ago, or who knows when, the last time we saw this, that um, there was, um, the questions were regarding just the, the um, sort of um, cultural awareness of the program as it comes to our schools, because it, it's not outside teachers doing it, it is our own um, right. teachers teaching it. And so they have taken, um, you know, the trainings that we offer for all of our educators and, and I'm, I'm assuming they take it, they take the plan that comes from, um, from Cascade and they kind of shape it for their students in a culturally uh, responsive manner. Correct. Yep. And we're even thinking about getting into the balance bike space because um, we're finding that some kids um, actually need that uh, practice um, before we actually get into a pedal bike. So we continue to evolve and think about how we can, um, you know, build the program and make it stronger and more accessible for all kids with the goal of bike and pedestrian safety um, to keep kids healthy and safe when they're making their way to school or just being active in community. That's great. Yeah, my incoming kindergarten is on a balance bike still. So yeah. <laughs> that would be perfect. All right. Thank you. No further questions. Any other comments, questions, or concerns from other directors? If not, uh, thank you, uh, Chief Scarlett and uh, Director Toner. And let's move on to introduction item number six. This is approval of, um, of the amendment to board policy 6550 and board procedure 6550. BP internal audit. Uh, this came through audit and finance on June 7th and is presented here for consideration. I am sponsoring this item with Vice President Hersey, Director uh, of Internal Audit and Ethics Officer Andrew Medina. I'm sorry, and Ethics Officer Andrew Medina will be uh, beginning the briefing on this item. Uh, Director Medina. Hello, Andrew Medina, Director of Internal Audit. Uh, this bar is to approve amendments to the internal audit board policy and board procedure. Last summer, Moss Adams conducted an independent review of the internal audit function. They issued a report in September, which included recommendations to create a high value internal audit function designed to help the district achieve its goals. In November, the board passed a bar directing full implementation of all Moss Adams recommendations. One of the key steps in completing that implementation is updating the board policy and procedure. Many of the changes to the policy and procedure were discussed at the October and November meetings, but some of the highlights include expanding the scope of internal audit activities to include all district functions, including programs. Uh, currently, our scope is focused on financial internal controls and compliance. Also requiring a presentation to the audit and finance committee for any external audits or reviews and also including internal audit at key stages of those engagements. Adjusting the frequency of the enterprise risk assessment to occur once every three years. Requiring validation for implemented corrective actions. Changing the set of auditing standards that we will follow and also clarifying the process for renewing the chief internal auditor employment contract. These amendments were discussed with the audit and finance committee in March and June and the committee moved them forward for consideration uh, with the understanding that some of the language be clarified. Since the last audit and finance committee meeting uh, we edited the language related to external audits and reviews to clarify that Internal audit should be made aware of these types of engagements, but that we will not be serving as the official district liaison. We also made edits um, to uncapitalize the term chief internal auditor. Uh, this term is common within the internal audit profession and is a term used by professional standards to refer to the head of the internal audit function. Um, it's not being capitalized uh, because it's not intended to refer to a specific position title within the district. Uh, if the district were to change the job title of the director of internal audit, the reference of the policy and procedure uh, would still be accurate and would not need to be updated. So overall, the policy and procedure amendments will allow internal audit to be of greater value to the district 
by helping it achieve its goals while strengthening the processes and procedures of the district. I'm happy to answer any questions and Tammy Lohr and Colleen Orzillis from Moss Adams are also in attendance today. If you have any questions you would like to answer, if you would like them to answer directly. Thank you, Director Medina. Um, I'll go first to Director Hersey for your as chair of the Audit and Finance Committee. Uh, thank you. We had a robust discussion about this in committee. I'm really thankful for the work that Andrew has put into this and moving forward with it. So uh, for the sake of trying to get everybody to a little bit more sunshine, I will pass to the next director. You're on mute, Director Hampson. Other directors, comments, questions, or concerns? Megan, <laughs> one hopefully quick question. I was wondering, was this, um, I know that um, internal audit or audit and finance, we created a, a new um, racial equity analysis, I understand, that's specific to um, FARS coming through the audit and finance committee, or at least specific to internal audit, I'm sorry. So was that used for this or no? That was not used to come up with the policy and procedure amendments, no, but the well, yeah. The board procedure does include a requirement that we will be using that tool that we developed specifically for internal audit engagements in the audits we conduct going forward. Thank you. Um, that was no, no other questions or comments right now. Other directors? Um, so in case anybody else is thinking about it, I think um, the the primary topic of um, discussion was about or, or sort of back and forth that we had in the, in our very robust discussion in audit and finance was about um, the extent to which internal audit serves as a um, a, an actor in the the um, generating um, management of uh, communication with um, outside audits that are that are brought in and, and done in the district because historically we've had external audits that um, haven't had the same level of um, follow-up in terms of uh, manage, management response. They've been done by a department head or um, other uh, uh, parts of the organization. And so part of this policy was to make sure that there was a central receptacle for that. And so um, we kind of, the pendulum went, um, was in one way that, that seemed to um, possibly be um, initially um, providing too much centralization of that function because there is such a, a unique uh, relationship between say the state auditor's office and our, our chief financial officer and, um, and their staff. And um, I, I would just note that I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with feeling like the language maybe swung too much in the other way, the other direction. And maybe that's something that um, could be worked out in procedure. I'm not sure. I haven't, um, because I don't have a creative or a thoughtful solution about it, I, I haven't responded about it, but I would like to uh, maybe talk a little bit more with, with um, uh, Vice President Hersey and um, uh, you and and Colleen and see if there isn't um, a tiny tweak that would address some of my concerns um, to make sure that we're that every audit that this organization does has the same level of um, rigor, I guess, in terms of how things are prioritized in the audits. How they're connected to, you know, risk management, for example, um, making sure that that there's a management response and that that there's an audit response. Um, and so, I think I I need a little more reassurance that where we are now with this policy is going to get to what we need and get and address the recommendations that were um, that Moss Adams provided, um, which I was uh, really supportive of, and yet at the same time also understanding. Um, how we don't want to get in the way of other relationships that that um, doesn't make sense for internal audit to, to take over. So um, those are my concerns. We don't necessarily need to talk about it here. I, I think it's just a, you know, potentially a small tweak, but if, if you want to respond, I'm open to that as well. 
I would just say quickly that um, certainly open to any discussions to make sure that it's uh, communicating uh, your expectations accurately. Uh, the procedure does go on to state that any external audits and reviews do require a presentation to the Audit and Finance Committee and also uh, that a corrective action plan be developed for each one that will be tracked and reported to the Audit and Finance Committee quarterly and then those also need to go through the same validation process that the internal audit results will also. Okay, well, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, like I said, I think I can probably get comfortable, be reassured, and, and maybe there's a, a word or two here or there that, that might um, get us there, but otherwise um, really excited about this work and so grateful for um, the work that's gone into this and I'm looking forward to seeing this, this move forward. It's um, been long overdue. So thank you for all of that. Um, and with that, uh, there being no other questions, comments, or concerns about this, thank you, uh, Director Medina, and we'll move on to introduction item number seven. Uh, resolution 2020-21-28, fixing and adopting the 2021-22 budget. This came through audit and finance on June 7th and is uh, was presented is presented for consideration. Chief Financial Officer Jolyn Berge, I believe you will be briefing us. Good evening, directors. This board action report would adopt the 21-22 school year budget. Before I move to the PowerPoint, I would note that on page two of the bar, we've included a four-year forecast for enrollment, revenues, and expenditures as required by the state. As we have discussed in the budget work sessions over the last year, we do have a structural deficit meaning expenditures are um, projected to exceed revenues, and that is outlined in the table on page two of the bar. Moving to the PowerPoint on slide two, uh, this outlines the agenda that we will be speaking to. So on slide two, please note that this presentation uses the categories, programs, activities, and object for expenditures. So the state requires that we report out and define um, expenditures using those titles and the state categories. Slide three outlines the funds that we administer at the district and for which the board sets a budget. So these funds would include the general fund, the ASB fund, slide three. Clay, maybe, you're, maybe it's getting is it slow? Oh, there we go. So on slide three, uh, it does outline the funds that we administer at the district and for which the board sets a budget. Those include the general fund, the ASB fund, the debt service fund, and the capital fund. You'll note that we're reporting out our projected beginning fund balance for school year 21-22, revenues and other financing sources, total expenditures, and then the ending fund balance. And you can see for the general fund, um, we have expenditures at just over $1.1 billion projected. On the next slide, <clears throat> slide four, this outlines our enrollment um, by headcount over time. And headcount's just what it would indicate, counting each um, student. And you'll note that there was a drop in this school year, 2021, due to the pandemic. Moving to slide five, slide five reflects our um, annual average full-time equivalent or AAFTE, which is the data upon which we are funded by the state. So just to note that AAFTE takes the headcount number and adjusts it by actual seat time and or partial enrollment and is generally less than um, actual headcount enrollment. Slide six provides an overview of general fund resources. And you'll note that our state, um, what we're showing here is our 1920 actual revenue from each of these sources, uh, the adopted budget, because we have not closed the year yet, so we don't know what the actual numbers for 2021 would be and then the 21-22 recommended budget 
you'll note that there is a drop in state um, revenue that's expected, and that's because of the adjustment of enrollment down to the actual level, the actual 2021 20, level um, for 21-22 carrying forward. And then you'll see a very large increase in federal, and that is due to the influx of ESSER dollars. Moving on to the next slide, slide seven outlines expenditures by state program. So regular instruction or basic education, there's a new category that the state is requiring for the ESSER dollars. Um, special education is our next largest category followed by support services. Slide eight is the same information, but shown as a um, graph. Again, noting that regular instruction is equal to 44% of our total expected expenditures. And that the federal recovery um, is 5.5%. So it's a pretty good um, amount for the upcoming year. Slide nine categorizes budget expenditures by state activity. So these activity activities um, include teaching and teaching support, the principal's office, really things that you would see in the school buildings and other support and central administration are those things that are supporting those activities. Um, again, you can note that we have about a $42 million increase in expenditures that we're expecting from our 2021 adopted budget to our 21-22 recommended budget. The next slide on slide 11, I'm sorry, slide 10, um, is a chart showing that same information um, graphically. And then slide 11 is just some information. It's not super intuitive what includes teaching or teaching support. So we provide this slide just so that you have some idea specifically what's included in those categories. Slide 12 shows budgeted expenditures by object. I would note that salaries and benefits, so that would be object two, three, and four, equals 83.3% of total budgeted expenditures. And that is on par and in alignment with other school districts and our previous history. Slide 14 uh, provides, so again, sorry, <laughs> slide 13 is the graphical representation of the previous data. Slide 14 compares direct services to support services for our district. So direct services, again, this is another way to talk about um, how we support our schools, how many of our dollars are really going out specifically to our school buildings versus support staff that are not in schools but are supporting those operations. Um, and then as we move on to the next slide, uh, showing that picture view. And then as we move to slide 16, this outlines our projected MSOC or maintenance supplies and operating costs. And this is funding versus expenditures. This slide is required by the state for us to report out. Um, you will note that budgeted expenditures are less than expected funding by about $5 million, which is a result of both the use of ESSER funds for areas like curriculum. So instead of spending MSOC, we're going to spend some ESSER dollars. And then there's other programs that do exceed state funding like special education. And while some of those dollars come, many of those dollars come from our levy, we also reallocate some of our um, MSOC dollars to cover those kinds of uh, programs as well. Slide 17 outlines our ASB budget. This is our associated student body. So this is really set and determined by our students, mostly our high school students. Um, you'll note that the actual expenditures for 1920 are uh, are pretty low. So our total expenditures are $3.2 million. A lot of those expenditures happen in the spring. We had the pandemic hit. Those expenditures did not happen. Uh, the budget uh, for 2021 would have been $5.4 million. We expect actual expenditures to be far, far below that because of the pandemic. And then as we recover and come out of the pandemic, they have submitted a budget for total expenditures of $4.5 million for student body activities. On the next slide, on slide 18, this is our debt service fund. Really the only activity that's going through this fund is our debt service payment for the John Stanford Center bond. Next slide. Uh, finally on slide 19 is the recommended capital fund budget. Uh, you can see uh, that we are 
anticipating total direct expenditures and transfers of just over $373 million. And uh, fund balance is estimated to decrease slightly, but still maintaining a very healthy reserve for our projects. And the detail behind the capital fund numbers were provided in that last June work session. Uh, that concludes the PowerPoint remarks. I would like to express my deepest appreciation for the work of Budget Director Linda Sebring and Capital Finance Manager Melissa Cohn and all of the great budget staff. And I would also like to thank those students and community members who contributed to our inaugural participatory budgeting process. That concludes my remarks and I'm happy to take questions. Thank, thank you, Chief Berkey. Let's, Let's start, start with, with this. Um, Director Hersey, Chair of Audit and Finance and Vice President. Thank you. Uh, I don't really have any questions. We had a very robust work session um, on our budget just last week. What I will say is that this is the opportunity again, inviting directors that if you have any feedback or any clarity that you need provided to you on your understanding of what is included in our budget and how we will be moving forward in support and partnership with senior staff, uh, given all of the things that need to happen between now and 68 days from now, please, please, please let us know ahead of time. And so with that, I will go ahead and pass it to whoever might have questions at this point. So directors, if you have questions, please indicate so by raising your hand and or turning on your video. And while we're doing that, just a note, uh, Chief Berge, there on the slide that showed the um, budgeted versus actual enrollment. You mean the last one that seemed to go down a little bit? Yeah, I was just gonna make sure you did <laughs> that. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. It doesn't show like that on the slide deck. It's so. fine in the what's posted. It just happened on your presenting version, so. I don't know about that, so we'll have to look. <laughs> um, yeah, just so folks don't think somehow we had negative right. enrollment. I noticed that. I thought, hmm, I wonder what happened. <laughs> um, okay, other uh, directors, any substantive um, comments, questions, or concerns? I know we've had many work sessions on this and lots of opportunity. Um, and definitely um, thanks to uh, the particip participatory budgeting process and having uh, many opportunities starting back in the fall, um, even before uh, the intense volatility of dollars that may or may not, or that at the time may or may not become available through um, state and federal sources. Um, we, we've had um, innumerable conversations as, as a board. And uh, so yeah, I encourage everyone to use this time to ask your um, your any unanswered questions um, so that we can move forward in a good way um, and, and have a, an approved budget at our next session. Um, let's see, Director, um, not sure who went first. Let's go with Director Rankin, who's top on my list here. Director Rankin. Thank you. Um, I have a, more of a comment, which is just that, you know, um, uh, our budget numbers all seem very, you know, big and a lot and like theoretically in people's minds, it should, should be enough for, you know, whatever, um, you know, and, and we could, we could just, you know, move things around on paper, whatever we want. And so um, that's obviously not the case. And I just kind of wanted to, I guess, say out loud on the record that, you know, the biggest expenditure that we have is for staff. And that is because education is not about a certain product or a, a certain um, commodity, but it is about people. It's about service to our students and there is no magic fix or you know quick solution to any of the things except for to further invest in in, in people, <laughs> um, in service to students and the adults that do all of the work to support our students. And I mean, as a parent, as a community member, um, we all know that nothing can, nothing can replace um, 
a really positive relationship between a student and their teacher or somebody in the building. And um, so I, I think I just want kind of wanted to say that out loud that even as we go into looking at, you know, recovery from COVID and thinking about, you know, a lot of people want to talk about what was lost. Um, the most important thing and the biggest thing we can invest in and also um, hold all of ourselves accountable for is the investment in in the people and that there's just no replacement for um, for uh, caring educators who are there for our students and then um, you know the central office that uh, staff that that does what they can do to support what's happening in the buildings um, uh, I don't really know what my point was. I think I just want, kind of wanted to say that out loud as a lot. There's a lot of like wanting to commodify things or come up with some certain, um, you know, product that can that can fix what was broken or repair what was lost in the last year and before. And um, I guess I just wanted to bring us back to the fact that uh, it really is it really is people and how um, how important those dollars are and how important the people are in the lives of our kids and um, really, you know, make or break this for, for students. And so um, thank you to the budget office for all of your work and, um, and responding to participatory budgeting desires and being willing to step into that um, because we, we, we don't have a lot of, a ton of flexibility in a seemingly large number. There are certain things that just have to be paid for that's not really negotiable and um, it just all comes back to the people. So um, thanks for all your work on that. Okay, Director Rivera-Smith. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, speaking of people, thank you to um, everybody who worked on this. Like, I look at the uh, the budget book and it. it's beautiful. It, it's colorful. I love the artwork. Um, and I'm thinking though, and in this, and also you know how we spoke earlier about the student handbook, about the readability of it and the accessibility of it. I'm wondering, a, what is the communications plan for this now? Now that we're you know, I know it's not approved yet. We're gonna that that comes later. But as it's approved, uh, you know, hopefully, and then we move on there. I'm wondering what the communications plan is there. And is this book uh, translated into our top languages? Uh, are there opportunities to be in community and um, you know pe walk people through it? I'm wondering what's going on there. So thank you for those questions, Director Rivera Smith. Uh, I'll have to get back to you on the translation part. I'm not sure about that specifically. Uh, we could translate it upon request. We do take this out and talk to many PTAs as we work through the budget or the upcoming levy questions or just their school staffing questions. So we do engagements all through the fall where we go out and talk to different um, sectors of the community and, and different PTAs and talk about the budget in that way. So it is posted online. It's shared broadly with our school principals. Um, so that that about covers it. Okay, well, um, and that's a little, I don't know, a little disappointing, I guess, because I do think of like uh, non-native English speakers trying to understand this. I first get a copy that they can read and then understand it, um, because I feel like that's that's really a part we're always struggling with as a district is to make sure that we're communicating thoroughly with our, our constituents and making things understandable, readable, um, accessible. So, you know, I think that would be something maybe hopefully we can, we can go on there is how to get this out in the community that are, are least likely to take the time to find it and and then request that translated version and understand it better because um we you know we want to empower our families to to understand what we're doing with the money. Yeah, and we could continue to offer. We have offered in the past, and we do go out with translators and talk about their questions or answer questions as well. So those we will continue to make that available if that's something that people find helpful. Thank you. No further questions. Director Dury. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say in, in the communication, in the realm of communications, especially to the community, I think there are a couple things that folks are continuously having questions about that maybe we could call out in some form um, of really around, especially as we return the fall, what the mental health services specifically will be at and, and are they available at each school? Um, building and by mental health, like just to be very clear on the word counselor, 
um, like actual like mental health counselor, not a guidance counselor for um, college and, and post graduation readiness, stuff like that. And then also, um, I, I'm curious, and I think I, I hope maybe other board members are, how do the goals we're creating align with the budget? Um, and how does the budget support those specific um, goals that we're working on as they support the strategic plan. So if we could just get um, call outs on those couple things, I would, I would appreciate that. Yeah, we can put something together, I think, too, with the new office that Carrie Campbell and Sarah Pritchett are running um, as far as the mental health supports and what that looks like in our schools. So putting together some information that we can share, we can definitely do that. Uh, and then we can put together some type of infographic, maybe, that talks more about how the strategic plan is embedded into the budget. Is that kind of what you were thinking, Director Jury? Yep, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, other questions, comments, concerns? Um, Chief Reggie, I only have one new question that I, I found that I missed in a prior look at the um, budget book. Um, and I'm guessing this is one of these, uh, this is a category, uh, categorization thing, but there was a time in 2019-20 when we had something called um, academic summer school under schools into continuous improvement that was budgeted for at 5 million and now is at um, is at nine million for 21, 22. Did that get recategorized elsewhere? I don't know off the top of my head. Are you on a certain page in the budget book or? Yes, page 45. Okay. <laughs> um, can we get back to you? So yes, between we can. Linda and I will be able to come up with, uh, we need to source the actual numbers and figure out how the data moved. Yeah, I'm just thinking it must be somewhere, it must be elsewhere because I know we spend more than that on summer school. Um, so, 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 um, Linda is here, um, and she says, <laughs> she says two things, part of summer school costs are recognized in ESSER, not in this program. So this is a department budget that you're seeing on page 45. Yeah. And so part of it's there. The other part is going to be in, um, so is in ESSER. Okay. For this year and next year. The, that's why yes, that's so for the, for this year and then yes and then in 1920 um yes as part of 1920 we ran that really really large yeah. summer school program last year yeah and and we're not running summer staircase which this represents in the same way this year okay, okay. um okay so i think that's um that, that'll be a good one to make sure all of us are clear about and then um are you planning on, you know, I'm a big fan of the Essers um, slide. So I don't know if you're going to have that for when we take this to action, but if it's, if you think it's appropriate to include. Yeah, I can put it as a slide um, at the end or as additional information. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's well done and, and it, and then we can, you know, when things like that come up in case somebody notices that, then they would, um, which I know they're not likely to pour through that budget book, but uh, it's important to know where that's sitting. Um, yeah. Okay, that's it for me. Um, and with that, um, if there's no other questions, comments, or concerns, um, thank you to Chief Berge and um, Director Sebring and all of their staff. And we will move now to introduction item number eight, approval of uh, purchase of new computers for certificated staff. This came through operations on June 3rd for approval. Uh, Director of Technology Infrastructure, Nancy Peterson, I believe you'll be briefing us. Yes, thank you. So the purpose in bringing this board action report is to purchase new laptops for teachers for distribution starting in November. We are bringing this as a not to exceed amount of $7.9 million. The estimated actual is actually a bit smaller, but that's based on the current quote and model and number of teachers that we're estimating. The funding is all in BEX 5. 
Our last purchase for certificated staff was in 2017, and that was the first time that we provided teachers with laptops versus desktops. The teachers like the flexibility of the laptops as well as the mobility that it gives them in the classroom. And um, as well as the increased um, flexibility for managing work and collaboration. Um, and it is also our opportunity to provide an equity of resources for our teachers. This is in line with a four year refresh cycle that we established in order to provide our educators with strong functional tools for their use in delivering the real critical work of our district. The older models are starting to fail beyond their, the repairability stage and need replacement. Batteries especially are beginning to fail and that directly impacts the ease of teaching in the classroom and that mobility that they prefer. Um, we spoke with or we've worked with the digital learning specialists and they have been testing the new model that we would like to provide to all of our teachers. We have more demonstration units due to arrive in August so that we can do a little bit broader uh, trials. Uh, DOT staff are also using these to um, check out how uh, robust they are and how flexible. The digital learning specialists are certificated teachers themselves, you may remember, and they work directly with the teachers in their classrooms and in how they use technology in instruction. And so they have, um, the digital learning specialists have confirmed that the new models have the features that they want and that they see being used in the classrooms and needed going forward. All the testers have reported that the new models are, have about twice the throughput of the old models. The batteries have a much longer battery life. And in fact, these batteries that we're looking at come with a three replacement warranty, which we've not had before. And that's really great. Uh, they have more memory, bigger hard drives, faster processors. It's just a really nice machine that I think is going to um, really be valued and appreciated by our instructors, our educators. The ITAC committee Information Technology Advisory Committee saw the model shown by a digital learning specialist, and they also reviewed the bar on May 24th and were supportive of that work. They also um, confirmed that those, those of the, the folks who are on the committee from other technology organizations in the area uh, confirm that that is very much in line with the kind of life cycle that they would expect of devices in their businesses. Um, if there are no issues from the further testing that we're doing this summer, then our plan is to place the order in September and we would expect delivery starting in November so that we were able, would be able to replace our teachers' laptops at that point. The current teacher laptops that are less than four years old will be refurbished for use by instructional assistants and other groups that maybe aren't covered by um, this purchase. Some of these are, quite a few are newer because they've been bought for new teachers or to replace failing or lost or stolen devices. So if the board has questions, I would be happy to answer those. Okay, we'll start with Director Rankin, um, a member of the Operations Committee. Um, I, I don't have any questions. <laughs> this is obviously a, a key need, so I'm glad that we can um, respond quickly to it and get it going. Okay, uh, any other directors have comments, questions, or concerns? Okay, um, thank you for that was very thorough actually Nancy very much <laughs> appreciate that uh, any questions I had were answered in your uh, intro so um, probably hence the silence. Um, thank you so much and um, with that uh, we will move on to uh, introduction item number nine uh, BEX 5 authorize the superintendent to execute the guaranteed maximum price amendment for the Northgate Elementary School replacement project this came through ops on June 3rd and is presented uh, for approval. Chief Podesta, I believe you'll be briefing us. 
Yes, thank you, President Hampson. As part of the BEX-5 capital program, um, we're uh, uh, constructing a new school building at the North Gate site. Um, this project is being managed through an alternative public works process um, where we bring in a general contractor construction manager early in the process to help us uh, 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 design and, and manage the um, overall pro project. Um, there is an administrative requirement um, on the part of the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction that because the contractor and that the actual contract was approved by the board uh, nearly a year ago on July of last year, and we were worked with the, with the contract in the intervening months, we get to the part where we actually finalize the price. So the board approved last July a, a contract not to exceed $60,461,530. And um, we've continued to develop the project and now uh, um, I will amend the contract with a guaranteed maximum price, which is slightly smaller, slightly lower at uh, $60,181,530. And again, this is a requirement of the public works process that the board again approve this actual price now that it's been settled after um, bids have gone out and we've worked with the general contractor on how we're going to manage the project. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Okay, and I will start with Director Rivera Smith, who is a member of the Operations Committee. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think Chief Podesta have covered it pretty well. I'm going to check my notes from that meeting, and um, I have here that Leidig did the project. Uh, geothermal wall installation began back the day before this meeting had, so that's already happening. Um, with the issuance of a mini Mac, do you want to know what the mini Mac was, Chief Podesta? A uh, mini Mac is uh, where we authorize a certain number of expenditures so that uh, um, uh, things can get rolling, but um, uh, don't really kick off the project in earnest until this final approval is, is made. Yep. So um, we talked about that and that we wouldn't see it again until final acceptance at this point now because this is getting the ball rolling. Um, and I'm hearing a weird echo, sorry. Um, but yeah, and we talked a bit about um, communicating this out better about how the decision has been kind of made and we, we are getting, as, as the directors all know, a lot of emails about this project. So having a communications plan to uh, just be more clear with uh, the communities about where we are at, the statuses, I think, was was the ask at the committee meeting. She put us as a sound familiar. Yes, that's all true. And and again, because of the alternative public works process we're using here, this this comes back twice. I mean, the decisions were made. The contract was awarded a year ago. Um, we are doing, you know, put up a construction fence. A little bit going on now. This is a step where you approve again the, the price in case it had changed. In this case, it's a bit lower, but this is not really the approval to proceed on this project. This is, again, um, confirming that we are getting a project at the price that the contract was awarded for. Um, and in this case, it's slightly less. Thank you. I don't have any other uh, questions or comments to make from that. Thank you. Okay, any other directors? Yeah, this is Director Rankin. Um, I just wanted to pipe in for a second. I talked to uh, Principal Didi earlier this week or last week. And um, if you're in the Northgate area or interested in construction, there is some cool stuff um, that uh, you can point your phone at and uh, it will tell you what kind of jobs are involved in what's happening, what you're looking at as construction happens. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to highlight that as a cool um, opportunity for education and not only once the building is completed, but in the work that's happening right now, um, families, community members can go by and and just learn something about um, the industry and different jobs and um, 
it's a it's a cool thing I haven't heard of happening yet at any of our other other sites. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there. Thank you for mentioning that, Director Rankin. This again, this is one of our first projects where the construction is being done uh, under the student community workforce agreement. So um, project teams and others are trying and our general contractor trying to be um, creative and thoughtful about um, workplace job site issues and how to recruit um, uh, local staff and perhaps staff that are, you know, construction teams that have uh, affiliations with our students are uh, what we're hoping to um, direct our capital program going forward. So we should be seeing more uh, more opportunities like that where we try to make sure that um, these are public dollars and that the public benefits from an employment standpoint on our capital projects. Okay, any other directors? Thank you, Chief Podesta. We will move now to introduction item number 10, Distress School Grant Award Construction Contract P5177, bid number B102018 to form a construction company for the Madison Middle School 8 classroom addition. Project and budget transfer. This came through ops on June 3rd and is recommended for approval. Back to you, Chief Podesta. Thank you. Um, uh, also, as uh, part of that capital program, we are doing a remodel and modernization at Madison Middle School. This will be an addition um, of eight classrooms. It um, will relieve overcrowding at the school and allow us to uh, remove portables that are at the site. Uh, the project was bid in May and we um, had a healthy bid pool with five bidders. Construction is scheduled to begin this summer and to be complete in the fall of 2022 to entertain questions about this project. Okay, and back to you, Director, uh, sorry, starting with you, Director Rankin, as a member of operations. Any comments, questions, or concerns? Uh, nope, nothing, nothing really. I'm glad that uh, we're able to do this as a classroom addition project um, and get some old portables uh, out of there. Um, is this the one that has the science classroom, new science room? You're muted, Fred. Um, there are science classrooms at uh, West Seattle Elementary. I am not sure if there's um, science classrooms also as part of this project. I may be mixing that up with something else. Just thought it was. It is. I'm looking at my notes, and um, and I did see in here that um, that uh, there was a recommendation that alternative two, three, and four be accepted, and those are recommendations that money be taken out of the core thing for application, um, specifically for the creation of science. Um, uh, yes. So yes, sounds like getting them. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> Yeah, positive stuff. And that I also see that Forma was the quote low respons responsible bidder. And so that's what we're doing. So thanks. Um, and also, Director Rivera Smith, there's a fair amount of feedback on your line. I don't know if you have any ability to fix I, that. I'm, but just okay, but I'm trying to move stuff. Sorry. Yeah, I'll work on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's move to introduction item number 11. And um, this is Distress School Grant Approval of Budget Transfer for the Lushite Elementary School 4 Classroom Addition Project. This came through Ops on June 3rd for approval. Chief Podesta, I believe you'll be briefing us. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, this is another classroom addition um, at Lushai, um, also to address, uh, allows for enrollment increases and the return of a preschool program to the school. Um, the, there's been some enhancements to the project's uh, scope, the construction of a secure uh, entry vestibule at the main entrance to the school and replacement of um, an outdated fire alarm system that um, is present throughout the building. Um, this is a, you know, while those are separate bodies of work, while we have the uh, other construction going on, it, it makes uh, 
uh, project efficiencies and also a little bit less disruption to the school to try to get this all done at once. So this budget transfer will support that. And again, this is a project that's starting this summer to be complete um, by next fall. Thank you. Any comments, questions, or concerns from directors? Okay, let's move on to introduction item number 12. This is BEC's five school construction assistance program and distressed school grant award construction contract P5179 bid number B102017 to blank for the Viewlands Elementary School replacement project. This came through operations on June 3rd for approval. Uh, back to the Chief Podesta. Uh, thank you. X5 does include a replacement um, of the Viewlands uh, building at, for Viewlands Elementary. Um, we have a very busy construction schedule given the size of the X5 levy, and occasionally um, uh, we'll bring, we'll introduce um, actions to the board before the bid, um, just so we can keep the projects moving and um, try to use at least the tail end of the construction season if we. Um, this project is because we can only bid so many projects um, at once as a practical matter, and we actually don't want to be um, competing with ourselves um, for contractors by having too many bids on the street at the same time. Um, so this project will be in August um, 10th. Uh, there's a construction estimate on the order of um, $58.7 million dollars and uh, the construction would start in late summer um, for completion in July 2023. You'll see a couple more um, board actions in this state where we're bringing them, we're introducing them at least before the bid is done. The bids will be complete by the time the board votes. Um, we discussed this in a uh, uh, good amount of detail with the operations committee at their May meeting, um, and this is uh, this happens to us occasionally in the summer, given that there are fewer opportunities to meet with the committee and the board, and there are more projects. So uh, occasionally we find ourselves in this state that um, we need to uh, kind of jumpstart things by bringing um, uh, approvals to the board, at least for introduction before the bid process is complete. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any comments, questions, or concerns from directors? My sound is working better. Nope, they're getting feedback, huh? I just wanted to uh, make a note about the blanks, about how we will have those at the day we, at time we vote for these. And so I think just for the public, just to alleviate any fears that we're approving things we don't even know what we're approving yet. Well, by the time we do approve it, those will, I understand, be filled in. We have several like this. So thank you, Fred, for that reassurance. Okay, um, if there are no other comments, questions, or concerns, let's move on to introduction item number 13. BEX 5 School Construction Assistance Program Award Construction Contract P5180, bid number B102029, to blank for the Kimball Elementary School Replacement, pro replacement Phase 2. This came through operations on June 3rd and is recommended for approval. Chief Podesta, back to you. Uh, likewise, just as with the previous item, um, this is a complete school replacement that's in the BEX 5 capital program. Um, we are bringing this item for introduction uh, ahead of the bid, which is scheduled for July 27th. And the uh, uh, maximum allowable construction cost estimate is $54.4 million. We expect um, bids, so far bids have been um, conforming pretty well to our estimates, and we would expect to uh, bring this back uh, once the bids are complete um, uh, to the board in August. And construction will begin in very late summer and uh, go through August of 2023. Directors, any comments, questions, or concerns? 
just just a quick appreciation that I understand there will be no fossil fuels used use for this school. So it's going to be built in compliance with our recent clean energy resolution. So a big thumbs up to that. That's true of, of these major projects that we're discussing this evening. Fantastic. Um, let's now move to introduction item number 14, BEX 5 and K3 class size reduction grant award construction contract P5170, bid number B102028 to Jody Miller Construction Inc. for the West Seattle Elementary School Addition Project. This came through operations on June 3rd and is presented for approval. Chief Podesta, back to you. Uh, again, this is a classroom addition. Um, for West Seattle Elementary School to we'll mitigate capacity issues at the school, allow us to remove portables as well. Um, there'll be an addition of 12 classrooms um, and associated uh, learning commons areas and some modernization of the existing building. In this case, we, we have completed the bid. The bid was done in, in May and we um, had a good, uh, again, a healthy bid pool with six bidders. Um, construction is beginning this summer and um, should be completed in September of 2022. Comments, questions, concerns from directors? Okay. And then uh, with the permission of our chief legal counsel, I believe we can go through 15, 16, and 17 all um, in one batch. Uh, correct, the three final acceptances can be intro together. Thank you. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so 15, 16, and 17 final acceptances for um, uh, contract, uh, let me just say, BEX 5 uh, playground improvements, um, Beacon Hill, Dearborn Park, Dunlap, Green Lake, Hawthorne, Lowell, Maple, McGilver, Montlake, and Olympic View, as well as number 16, um, which is the final acceptance of um, the Musco Sports Lighting LLC work for the athletic field lighting at Franklin High School. Uh, and finally, the um, uh, acceptance of contract K5078 with Forma Construction um, and uh, budget transfer for the Magnolia Elementary School renovation and addition project. All three of these came through operations on June 3rd uh, for and are presented for approval. Back to you, Chief Podesta. Thank you, President Hampton. Um, we discussed at a recent board meeting um, some playground improvements at Green Lake. And there, we had some discussion at that time about the um, equity issues related to playground funding and how um, we relied because we were accepting a gift in that instance and um, uh, we had a, a thoughtful discussion about that. We are trying to take steps by funding more playground improvements um, in our capital program where the uh, past the district really relied on schools and PTSAs to um, find funding to make improvements. And this is, uh, we're happy to report that um, we've made improvements at the list of schools uh, associated with this action. I won't read that list again. Um, and those projects have gone well and are in service. And so this is an acceptance of the contract for um, those various projects. Um, item 16 is uh, final acceptance for uh, lighting improvements. Um, at Franklin High School, we've had a program. We brought several of these to the board over the past couple of years. We've had a program of increasing lighting at our athletic fields. This was really a requirement as a result of uh, changing bell times and um, later start times and end times for schools. So uh, we could continue to have community access on our projects. We rely heavily um, on our partnership with Seattle Parks um, to use um, uh, their athletic fields, uh, athletic fields owned by the city of Seattle for some of our athletic programs. And it, um, also in exchange, we give access to the community um, to our fields. Um, student use is given first priority and is used immediately after the end of the school day, which um, pushes community um, use to later in the day. And as we had changed the schedule, um, we added lighting so that we, the um, schools uh, athletic fields can be available 
for community use a bit later. And again, we're uh, we're growing. The city is growing. There's um, really demand on athletic fields in general by for our uses, for other youth community uses, and adult recreational uses. And um, it's important to try to maximize access um, to this, these public assets and projects like this allow that to happen. And projects completed, and we're at a point where we can um, accept the final work from the contract. Um, and the last uh, final acceptance um, I'm really happy about it. It's final acceptance from Magnolia Elementary um, School, which uh, was a, there was a renovation and a modernization of a landmark building. We added uh, four classrooms and a gymnasium upgrades to mechanical and electrical systems, uh, seismic improvements and other building system improvements and demolition of portables that were located at the site. Our contractor Forma completed the work. Um, I'm sure Many directors have been there. It really is a, was a beautiful project and uh, had uh, a lot of res uh, respect for the existing building and um, really created a, a great asset. Um, working in um, historical buildings can be unpredictable, um, particularly one that was closed. Um, it was both landmark and had long been closed as for use as a regular school. Um, so the project was uh, over budget uh, by uh, about 3%, which uh, given the uncertainty associated with this kind of project, um, I think we feel that uh, overall this project was a great success and are um, uh, glad to have the school open again and happy to present it for final acceptance to the board. Okay, any comments, questions or concerns from directors on these three items? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Chief Podesta, as always, uh, for your focused and thorough presentations of so many um, good capital projects. And thank you to our uh, voters and uh, uh, taxpayers for uh, allowing us to do this good work for our students. And with that, we will move to board comments. And uh, I'm going to uh, be ask folks to keep it um, as close to two minutes as possible. Uh, it's most I think if your houses are like mine, they're heating up at this hour, and um, uh, be nice to give um, staff the the evening. So I am going to start with uh, Director Hersey. Thank you so much for all the work this year. Have a wonderful summer, and I hope everybody out there listening get some opportunity to get some good rest and spend it with your family. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Director Dury. Um, yeah, I'm just reiterating what Director Hersey just said. Thanks to the staff, teachers, um, building leaders, families, students. It's been a year and I appreciate the work and effort everybody's put in and hope everybody gets some downtime to rest and relax and um, come back at it next year rejuvenated. Thanks. Director Rivera-Smith. Okay, there we go. Hopefully you can hear me without feedback. Um, thank you, thank you. I feel like I've talked a lot in this meeting, so um, I'll try to be short. I want to say, though, going back to Head Start, um, one thing that I didn't mention then, but want to go ahead and mention now is um, Head Start is a few key staff members, and so I want to give a really big a shout out and heartfelt thank you to Family Services Supervisor Abby Myers, who has worked with the district for the past five years, um, and she's moving on. Um, to uh, uh, sort of home employment, but uh, we really appreciate her work and she's been a joy to meet with monthly and um, a strong asset to the early learning and Head Start team. She leads the policy council meetings and is, she's truly missed. Um, so thank you to her. Also, we're uh, losing um, Michaela Melanson. I'm probably butchering the name, I'm sorry. Um, our West Area Supervisor who's worked with the district for 12 years. Um, actually started by volunteering for community service in high school. So um, we're moving on also. 
So just want to give a shout out to those people. Thank you for your time with us. Um, and uh, be well. <laughs> um, I'll just mention I'm having, in, in lieu of an online community meeting this month, I'm going to be doing a walk at Green Lake, which is right in the middle of my district, so it's perfect. Um, on Sunday, June 27th, I'm trying to start early. I know it's supposed to be a hot day, so, you know, I'll, I'll see who shows, but it's 10 a.m., hopefully not too early, but not too late to not burn up. But uh, do a walk and talk, and um, just um, I'm looking forward to seeing who comes out. So everyone's welcome to that. Um, and I also will just say that um, I'm reaching out. I, I reached out to my, um, my I have 13 schools now because Lincoln Springs is now part of District 4. So I reached out to my 13 schools um, to, uh, to just share so, – so I'm getting feedback, I think, but um, to share um, that I'm, I've been speaking with um, families of color at our schools, um, specifically at Hamilton, for a recent um, sort of shakeup that was going on there. Anyhow, um, before the pandemic, we all knew that racism and inequity existed in our in our district, and COVID-19 just eliminated those injustices in a broader, shinier light. And here in the North End. Um, our families of color have felt the effects of, you know, just the legacy of um, racially um, neighbor restrictive neighborhood covenants and redlining, and families of color continue to feel just um, oppressed and erased in our schools very often. So, um, as we set a path towards full time enrollment in the fall, um, it, there's no time to waste in hearing from these families. So. Um, I, I'm making a, a more um, effort to do that, um, especially because, like I said, we're getting ready to come back in. So I want to hear the stories and experiences that will hopefully shape the work that we're doing as a, as a board, as a district, to, um, to end the harm that racism causes in our schools and classrooms. Um, just one step in that work is going to be, like I said, trying to engage with the families more, our families of color or students of color, um, and which I know is going to be a little more difficult in summer. And that they're not historically the ones that are on PTSA memberships and mailing lists. So, um, but I'm going to be trying to work with uh, the PTSAs in my district and any other um, entities that I can bring on board to to put together some conversations with the families of color, and again use that you know put a spotlight on those experiences because that's what's going to help us get where we need to be as a district to know uh, where those where those challenges are and help us to live up to our values and missions and goals. So. Sorry, a lot of words, but thank you again for everybody. I, I guess we're up until, so, well, um, I don't know where our next board meeting is, but uh, stay safe, stay cool, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Director Rankin. I'm going to keep it super short. Drink lots of water. Don't leave pets or kids in the car. Um, it feels like it's the end of the year and, uh, you know, taking off on a break and in in some ways that's true but in a lot of ways we're just we're just keeping on going um keeping on going and getting ready to come back better in the fall um so everybody uh take a breath get a little rest and um be ready to jump back in for our kids thank you um yes and thank you to um dr jones and his staff for uh, keep, for ca keeping count on the days till school starts. Um, but sorry, this is Director Hampson. I would uh, also say that while this is a um, definitely, as far as my kids are concerned, um, you know, all um, havoc should reign at this moment with with no structure and um, no accountability. And um, yeah, this is the time when we get to. Uh, quietly do some some work to make sure that we can deliver um, what our students need so that uh, we can better provide uh, opportunities for them to learn and uh, know and succeed in their hopes and dreams um, and to find joy in their in their classrooms and yes I'm very concerned about um, uh, all of our families and the heat that is about to come we know that most folks in Was Western Washington do not have air conditioning and so um, this is a pretty extreme um, time that we have coming, so find ways to communicate with uh, folks in your community about how to stay safe, um, particularly as people um, may be entering the water that, that don't necessarily have um, swimming skills. And then I also just wanted to take a moment to mark and acknowledge um, we've had a um, uh, possibly quiet but absolutely critical um, shift uh, in the history of the U.S., 
um, as the Department of the Interior will now formally investigate the impact of federal Indian boarding schools, uh, thanks to Interior Secretary Deb Holland, um, which was announced on uh, yesterday, Tuesday. And this will result in, a, result in a detailed report compiled by the Interior and will include historical records of boarding schools, burial sites, and enrollment logs of children's names and tribal affiliations, um, which up until this point have um, been scattered and, and difficult to find and only through uh, our own individual efforts as the um, descendants of the survivors of those um, uh, boarding schools of, of which I am one and um, I can't express how meaningful this is um, as the president of a public school board um, and um, also the uh, descendant of the survivors of uh, boarding schools um, in which the express purpose was um, the federal government's um, stated attempt to wipe out tribal identity, language, and culture. Um, and the extent to which that past has continued to manifest itself through long-standing tra trauma, uh, cycles of violence and abuse, premature deaths, uh, mental disorders, and substance abuse. Um, I, I can uh, barely speak to that without getting tremendously emotional, um, but I have great hope um, in our secretary. Um, and I'm so grateful for her appointment um, and, and just want to quickly read something that she said that I think we can all um, look to in our own leadership roles. Um, I don't see it as my role to be the voice for all Native people, but rather to amplify your voices so that American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian communities have a seat at the table to speak for themselves, Holland said. By sitting at this table together, we can build a better relationship for future generations that is not rooted in the worst in the worst parts of our past. Um, and so with that, I will say, um, Pina Gigi, thank you, stay cool. And um, as there is no further business on the agenda, this meeting stands adjourned at 6.41 p.m. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.